think we're ready. Matt, good to go. Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to day two of uh, Dinosaur Arc 38. Um, this morning's first session is uh, has two talks, each 25 minutes, um, and our timekeeper this morning is Suzanne Wolf. Um, thanks to Comcast as the workshop and connectivity sponsor, and VeriSign as the 2022 workshops patron. Um, a reminder uh, for both of the speakers this morning that you'll see, we've got a poll that comes up on your screen, and please do fill that out. It helps us in the program committee um, uh, figure out how we're going to best curate content for the next talks. Um, a note for the presenters on the Q&A, um, any remote participants, I'll be reading out the questions uh, during the Q&A. Please preface, um, uh, preface your questions with the pound questions hashtag so they're visible in the workshops channel. And of course, anybody here in the room can come up to the microphone. Um, so with that, our first speaker is uh, Jeff Houston uh, with the resolvers we use. Thanks a lot for that, John. And good morning, everyone. Hopefully, I am clear and you can hear me, right? Weird, no fold back up here. Okay, my name is Jeff Houston. I'm with APNIC. And this is work that I've done uh, in collaboration with Joao Damas, who's also with APNIC. Um, based around that area of the intersection between measurement and policy. You see, as far as I can tell, no one said this, but they probably thought it. Because particularly if you're in the, in the EU region and you actually look at what resolvers do folk use in the EU to get their DNS names, then there's one entity that just dominates the environment as a single resolver class. And of course, that's run by Google. It's enormous. Now, there's no contract. There's no agreement. No one signs up to do this with Google and Google acknowledges. You just aim yourself at all eights, right? And it's almost permissionless. And as far as I can tell, looking at the sad story of Quad9 and its brush with the EU judicial system, Google doesn't seem to have that applicability. It's a US company working out of the US obligations in the international treaty space. And that is slightly outside of what applies to companies who are effectively corporately domiciled in the EU itself. So they're slightly outside the regulatory framework. Yet they dominate, totally dominate. And this is essential. I'm like, as I was reading this morning, God knows why, the blurb about DNS OARC, you know, why does it exist? And inside that blurb was the thought experiment. What would happen if we turned it off? The DNS, just turned it off. And the answer is, that's it. There's nothing left. It's gone, the internet itself. And so you can understand at a policy level, having your entire infrastructure dependent on folk who really aren't accountable inside your framework is not the best, most ideal solution. And when we look at the motivations behind that recent proposal, which is still active on DNS for EU, it seems to me personally that some of that thinking was there, even though no one said it, even though no one said it. And it's kind of interesting because the key sentence in that entire thing is this measurement of the resolvers we use. What does it mean? And, you know, in the DNS, almost nothing happens at face value. And if you really want to measure the resolvers we use, then the question is, what should we measure? And what does that measurement actually inform us in a policy sense? And, and that's sort of where we embarked in this process to try and understand what's going on. Now, as I think all of you would know by now, and if you're not, see me later, um, we use a massive measurement platform based around Google Ads. Ads are everywhere. You've seen them, everyone sees them. Very hard to stop them in most places. And the ad has a script. All ads have scripts. And the script runs when the ad is impressed. You don't have to click, you don't have to do anything. The ad just does stuff. Now, we launch about 20 million of these ads a day and Google, very politely, splashes them all over the planet, even in the Faroe Islands. Um, and so we get a relatively comprehensive and broad view of the network, of all of the network, 
at the level of users and browsers. IoT? No. Any other piece of infrastructure? No. This is about where ads go. So with that filter in mind, this is what we're looking at. Now, the way the ad works is actually interesting in this respect, that when the ad is impressed, we, over there in the ad factory that actually created the campaign, get a notification. So we see a message coming out as a URL fetch from the party running the ad. So to the extent that IP addresses are you, and in the world of private relay and VPNs, that's not strictly true for a lot of folk, but to the extent that that's possible, we geolocate, we try and figure the country, the, we certainly try and figure the origin AS, we try and figure out where this ad is being placed, yay. And we account in the domain name system, the, the DNS queries that come afterwards, all of the queries that user is going to make when they run the test. These names are unique. The DNS labels is actually a piece of microcode because if you do your server right, you can embed a whole bunch of information in the query that affects the way the server is going to answer. The user asks the question to the recursive resolver. It's a unique question. There is no cache to look up because it's unique. So it comes to our authoritative server sooner or later. What we see is the recursive resolver that asks a question and that embedded identifier that we put in the DNS query name that says, I know where this came from originally. So now in this measurement, we're able to match some approximation of the user, VPNs, etc., notwithstanding, to the recursive resolver that actually generated that query that we saw in our authoritative server. Now, we made this one, unlike other tests, where we deliberately muck around and go, nah, you didn't want to know that. Uh, we answer all the time immediately. You know, immediately, A or quad A, here's an answer. And it's a good answer. You can use it. It's unsigned and everything is small, neatly within 512. No fragmentation here. And what we're trying to do is to minimise all of the reasons why DNS tries again, tries different resolvers, yada, yada, yada. You ask, you get an answer, fast as we can. Um, we also try to understand which resolver are you actually using. Now, of course, Google doesn't ask authoritatives from all eights as a source. There's a whole bunch of engines with their own addresses. And uncovering them sometimes is easy. Google published those addresses. And sometimes not so easy. Some do, some don't. And the ones that don't, we actually use Ripe Atlas and we actually seed a whole bunch of queries across where Ripe Atlas is to these open recursive resolvers against our resolver. And what we, what we actually see at the authoritative server are all of the back-end addresses that are used by those open recursive resolvers. So that's how we can map IP addresses of recursives into the front-end service for things like OpenDNS, AdGuard, et cetera, et cetera. So, we can now map, based on those IP addresses, the resolvers that people use to the AS of the end user that got the ad. Um, now, we actually do a number of classifications here, and, and they're pretty broad, because I don't think I care what resolver you individually use. That's not really the name of the game. It's all about big numbers. I care if you're using the resolver your ISP gave you, or something else in the same AS, which pretty much suggests you haven't mucked with a thing. It's just the default, knock yourself out, right? I care if it's a known open DNS resolver. Now, what is a known open DNS resolver? There are probably still millions that are open DNS resolvers, but most of them are accidental. So we found about 20 that seem pretty common Oddly enough, a whole bunch of them are Chinese uh, and only work in the Chinese community. But there are others, and we kind of got an arbitrary list. Um, we also look for resolvers that aren't in the same AS, are not, but geolocate, to the extent geolocation works, into the same country as the user. Now, sometimes the ISP, and there's a couple in Sweden, that put their DNS resolvers into a different AS, but it's all in Sweden. So in some ways, that's kind of same country, but different AS is almost the same case as same AS. 
And last and not least, those weirdo ones where the resolver seems to be from somewhere way else and the user is, you know, in a different country, in a different continent. So those are the categories we use. Um, this slide, you need to actually look online, but I've summarised the outcome. is what we've seen in the EU region for the last uh, 18 months. The blue line at the top says around about 70% of measurements, and I'll use the word measurement because this is really what does it mean, see around 70% of measurements are the same AS. You're not mucking with the defaults. The next one, the red line, is where the query reappears from Google. 16%, which is relatively significant. 8% uh, is it came from the same country, not the same AS. And 5% is the next open resolver. There are more, but 5% is the, the, next, the next largest, which is the Cloudflare All Ones open recursive resolver. So 70, 16, 8 and 5 for the measurements we did. And it's a single query, just one query, one unique domain name, only appears once in the DNS. Now, you'd think, because I'm answering as fast as I can, there's one query being seen at the authoritative server. You'd be wrong. That only happens 30% of the time. Because not only is the DNS designed by folk who are obsessive compulsive, it's designed by folk who are incredibly impatient. And even when you ask A, you tend to ask B as well, and C, and D, and E. And so 30% of the time, even if there are multiple queries, they come from the same IP address, but 60% of the time, two or more IP addresses are involved in making that query, right? Most of the time, it's all in the same AS. It's as if there are server farms, and server farms are pretty common in the DNS, but the load balancing is not exactly clean, and the query is getting replicated. That's a cumulative distribution. Look closely. Uh, it's even too vague for me to see. But in the far right, there's always outliers. One initial query, and I see more than 100 different IP addresses coming back within 20 seconds going, answer, 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 answer. This is a really pressing question. And it's kind of bizarre that there's some relatively big amplification, tiny amount, but almost inexplicable why the query gets farmed across so many different IP addresses. Lots of theories, including dynamic source addressing, where a resolver will use a different source address, and it's possible in v6 to go through that for every single query, because, you know, you can. Um, most of us see these individual, what I, I call stub queries, that for each query domain, 3.23 distinct resolver addresses. And the real question is, if you are using two resolvers, or three, should I count them all? They're seeing your queries, but what does it mean in the measurement? Do we sort of say, oh, you're using Google and Cloudflare and your ISP, so we'll put a one in every box? Or do we decide between them? Or we do a third of a hit for each? So what do you do with these kind of multiples that happen 60% of the time? Uh, OK, so we don't know what we're measuring. We really don't know what we're measuring. So is the question, who might see your query? Who could possibly see your query? And that's a question we thought, OK, let's go down that path to see how many folk could possibly send their queries to Google, Cloudflare, or anyone else. So what we do? is we always answer serve fail. Because serve fail at the moment, extended DNS error codes are your enemy, um, <laughs> serve fail causes the client and the recursives to try the next authoritative server. They, they, sorry, try the next recursive at the client side. So what we're doing is making sure the client, by always answering serve fail, goes through all of the locally configured recursive resolvers. They'll cycle through until they find an answer. There is no answer they'll either time out or exhaust the list. So now we measure that. 72% use their local ISP. The Google number has climbed by 10%. Around 26% of our measurement samples now are seen by Google. 
but we are pushing. It's always serve fail. So if Google is number two or number three, if all else fails, let's try Google. All else has failed. Let's try Google. So it is an artificial measurement. Cloudflare has risen to 6% by that methodology. So this is the folk who might be looking if you're asking a dud question. If you're asking a question that actually results in serve fail, if all else fails, they might see your queries. So subtly different question. Who sees the resolver now? Because we're doing serve fail, most folk do have backups. So only 12% of the time do we see that single IP address making the query. Only 12% of folk have no plan B. Everyone else has a plan B of some sort where we get the query from different IP addresses. 30% of cases are two or more, and the number goes all the way out to a little over a thousand different IP addresses in 20 seconds on that extreme edge case. I don't know who it is. Good luck to them. You know, a disproportionate amount of traffic. Are we there? Not really. Because now we actually want to know who do you believe? Not who sees you, who do you believe? And so in the third pass, what we actually do is just simply look at the first resolver that, the, the first resolver that asks us the question. Because we're going to answer every one, presumably the first recursive that gets it is the one that passes back to the user. We can't tell, but that's what we're trying to see. That's the answer. And all of a sudden, it looks very different. Google is now back to 15% on first answerer. It sees far fewer of our sample measurements. And so we can try and put this together. And what's Google's share in the EU? And if you try and think of users, then the real question is, who might see you? Google might see 26% of these measurements. Who is going to see you, even if you don't believe them? It's down to 16%. Who do you believe? First answer. Uh, Google's down to 15%. But who's we? Because we is a really interesting question. There are enterprise users. There are you and I as mass market consumer users. And all of these enterprise customers, if you look at the DNS, are much more prone to actually changing their DNS. Let's take the big consumer ISPs and only look at them as the origin AS. So I get rid of a whole bunch of data centers, enterprise users, and just look at the folk who, oddly enough, aren't doing VPNs either. I'm actually seeing those folk located in their home consumer network. Wow. If you look at it now, Google's down to almost nothing, 4%. Cloudflare down at 1%. The same, I, same AS is now all the way up to 87%. Most consumers don't play with the buttons, and certainly in the EU, most ISPs do their own resolution. They don't forward off to some other resolver. Different in Africa, but EU, that's the case. So where are we? I can add a fourth column that kind of goes, in the consumer world, 87% just use the default. Google's share in that consumer world is all the way down to 4% of users. Most consumers don't play. So most users use their ISP resolver. Um, additional users they use resolvers in different networks, but in the same country. Enterprises are different. What we didn't actually look at, who gets to process your query over time? Who passes queries on to others? There's a huge business in query log farming. We could see it, but we didn't look in this particular exercise. What we did do, though, is actually look at the time, because the query has the time the original query was, the query name was formed. And we go, who's replaying logs at us and how many are being replayed? And the answer is, a lot. One day we get 612 million DNS queries, 23 million, or around 4%, uh, are older than an hour. The original ad has long since disappeared. The reason for the query has gone away, yet we're seeing this savagely persistent replay that most of them, 50%, are between 1 and 12 days old. Some are all the way out to years. Some of your logs that you replay are old and venerable logs. Delete them. They're not very good. Um, the responses that we do have TTLs of only 60 seconds, so the original cache should have gone. So the DNS is phenomenally persistent, but that's kind of a different idea, who gets to see your query, as distinct from who do you believe, who are you going to actually take as an answer. So back to DNS for EU. 
Is Google dominant in the consumer world of the European Union? In the consumer world, not the enterprise world. And, and the real answer is, well, yes, no, or if you like, no, and yes, it's very hard to tell. And, and quite frankly, most users are actually led by their ISP divided, provided default DNS resolver. There's certainly an undeniable issue about the way the DNS resolution market is dominated by a single US player. That's undeniable. But to what extent it creates policy issues for all other countries and their issues around consumer protection, that's a much harder question to answer. Because when you look at this data, what superficially might look like, wow, 25% of European users are sending all their information to Google, is not correct. It really isn't. It's not like that. And what it really, I suppose, means is that measurement is interesting, measurement is difficult, but interpreting that measurement is perhaps even more challenging than setting the measurement up in the first place because these numbers can mislead you in all kinds of odd ways. And I'm not saying that DNS for EU is based on that or not. That's not the issue. But what I am trying to say is when you start doing this measurement, qualifying and precisely quantifying that measurement and aiding its interpretation is essential. Uh, and I think I've done it in two minutes for questions. Thank you. Four and a half. Wow, four and a half. <laughs> Thank you very much. I thought the protocol was we all entered our questions didn't matter most, but I'm here at the mic. You said, I'm pretty sure I heard you say that extended DNS errors were your enemy. Would you like to elaborate on that? Um, the issue is serve fail has been used by DNSSEC and a lot of other cases. And I actually rely on that to do a whole bunch of other tests, particularly about the way DNSSEC works. And I was relying on a similar mechanism where I basically say back to the client, it's actually not a serve fail, it's a keep going through the list kind of error, and that's what I really mean. And when you start to get extended errors that go, actually this went wrong, and you should only do a much smaller response, because like validation failure, you're retrying a different resolver, doesn't really make a lot of sense. And things like Google, for example, don't. And so, for this kind of experiment where I'm trying to flush out everything, I need an error condition that kind of goes, just press on. You know, the answer is coming. If only you found the right recursive to answer it. Not really, but you know, that's what's going on in the experiment. So that was the only reason why. It was in jest. Extended error is a good thing, right? For everyone except me. Unless you want to build Jeff's DNS, which you know, would be great, but wouldn't either. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff. Our, our next spe speaker is Peter Lowe with uh, the title, which is near and dear to my heart, The uh, Bizarre and Unusual Uses of DNS. Peter? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Lowe. I'm the principal security researcher at DNS Filter, and I spend a lot of time looking at domain names and stuff. Um, my talk is Bizarre and Unusual Uses of DNS. Uh, subtitle is Rule 53. If you can think of it, then someone's done it in the DNS. Uh, sorry, so I thought of a bunch of different titles for this talk. I uh, spent a while on that, actually. Uh, the things people do with DNS, or 20 wacky DNS tricks, number five will shock you. Uh, but I went with something a bit clickbaity in the end because I was hoping to get people to listen. Um, so I should explain why I put this talk together. It's mostly John's fault, John Todd. He uh, suggested that it might be possible for malware people to distribute actual malware via DNS, uh, which I think is a dangerous thing because now it's actually going to happen. Uh, this is all part of our... DNS abuse SIG work, which we do for thirst.org. Um, so if you are not familiar with that, have a look. Um, rule 34 implies that just thinking of something brings it into existence. So uh, please don't suggest anything too crazy because it might actually uh, cause it to uh, exist. A couple of notes. Uh, most of these things that I'm going to talk about aren't around anymore, unfortunately. Um, I thought I would have more time for this talk as well, so there's quite a few slides, and I hope we're going to get through them all. 
And there's a bunch of links at the end for anybody who wants to download or check them out later on. Also, I'm terrible at slides, so I apologize in advance. So, I'm going to start off with some trace routes. These aren't technically 100% DNS, but um, they qualify um, for the purposes of this talk, at least, anyway. This is the first one that I ever came across. It's a, a trace route that shows the scrolling text from Star Wars Episode Four. It's by a guy called Ryan Werber from uh, Beagle.net, and it popped up in uh, 2013. It's down now. There's a story around about it where uh, it went down because of a, a DDoS. Um, but some IPv6 versions appeared later on, and it's gone but not forgotten. It's another one is uh, an extension that uses IPv6. Um, apparently, if you increase the number of hops, then you get even more of it, which I, I didn't check out myself. But it's uh, a mysterious and kind of surreal hand. It's the black hand that is uh, uh, stealing your data, apparently. One of my favorite ones is um, Sebastian Haas, who's done a bunch of different things with uh, DNS. Uh, he put, he's created a, a piece of software called Fakerty, or Faker, so I'm not sure how to pronounce that. It creates a ton device locally that can uh, fake a, a trace route. And what he used this to set up the live scores for the Euro 2020 when it was happening. Uh, he's at underscore Sahas on Twitter. He's got a bunch of interesting things. Um, another one is makerforce.io uh, by a guy called Ambrose Chua. This has got the uh, alternative lyrics to um, American Pie in it, which I thought was kind of fun. Um, and I think this is the last one there. If you're familiar with Dr. Horrible's sing-along, there's uh, a thing that comes up every now and again, which is the um, bad horse. So if you trace a trace route to bad horse, you'll get this. And if you want a bonus, check out the certificate chain from sign.bad.horse online, because there's another little Easter egg there. And lastly, this was uh, requested by Andrew Camping, because the last time I did this was around Christmas. Um, it's a Christmas-themed trace route. So, ho, Peter, ho, ho. It's Peter, completely inappropriate now because... Can you speak a little closer? Oh, to I'm me? sorry. There we go. There, there we go. <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, completely inappropriate now because we're in the middle of summer, but uh, happy Christmas for anybody watching it six months from now. A more interesting category of DNS uh, misuses is the tools and toys. Here's one from uh, postel.org which unfortunately isn't around anymore. It's a simple calculator. I really like it because you can just look at it and see what kind of output you should expect to get from it. There is a version of this, or a, a reverse Polish calculator that's out there, which I don't quite understand. Someone explained it to me once and um, didn't, uh, didn't stick. Um, a couple more useful tools are the My IP things. I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, Googling what's my IP. Uh, you can do it via the DNS. There's a couple of examples here from Google and one from OpenDNS. Uh, these actually still work, so I've used these before when I've connected to a, another Wi-Fi network. And I think out of all of these things that I'm going to talk about, the Google What Is My IP uh, tool will probably exist longer than all of the others because, as uh, we all know, that is the only service that they really care about. One of the uh, tools here from Team Kumru, I actually, I don't know how to pronounce them uh, properly. Team Kumri? Kumru? Uh, Kumri, thank you. <laughs> um, is IP to ASN mapping. This is actually really useful, and it's got a bunch of different ways it can be used. It's kind of like Whois, but um, faster, and uh, you can interpret the results programmatically. Oh, sorry, yeah, I think I put duplicate slides in here. I put some, made some last-minute modifications to the slides and uh, forgot to delete this one. And another little tool here is um, postcodes. So you can look up a postcode and get the uh, geolocation from it. I don't know why that would be useful, but if you're planning to uh, find somewhere, then perhaps that could be useful. This is from uh, JP Menz, uh, Jan Piet. And there's a site out there called dns.toys, which popped up recently. And um, this has a whole bunch of things. It's got a conversion currency, uh, currency conversion, sorry, 
world time, uh, another what is my IP, um, and numbers to words as well, which is kind of weird. And that's by a guy called Kailash, Kailash Nad, who's the CTO of Zeroda. My, one of my favorites is this geocaching hint. Um, if you're not familiar with geocaching, it's where you get a location, go and find a little, uh, well, a geocache somewhere in the world. There's a couple of million of them worldwide. And the description for one of them is a, a host name. And if you look at the text record for it, you get a hint um, to, uh, that points you in the right direction to find it, which I love. The name of the, um, uh, uh, of the cache, each cache's name, uh, is a reference to Dr. Paul Mokapetris. Uh, unfortunately, I was told that he isn't the owner of this geocache, but um, it's kind of, kind of cool anyway. Another category is DNS tunneling. There's some debate as to the exact definition of what tunneling encapsulates, but um, here's some things which I thought might, uh, might fit, uh, fall into that category. So the general idea of tunneling is to um, uh, send uh, data over uh, another protocol which it wasn't intended to be. So it was discussed, I tried to find references to it for DNS tunneling in particular, and I found something on uh, Slashdot from back in 2000, it's probably been uh, going on a lot longer than that, but um, yeah, if you're not familiar with it, um, I guess all you guys probably are, but uh, some people who might be watching this uh, could use this explanation. So uh, one example is to tunnel uh, Wikipedia over, um, over DNS. This is, I, I mean, it works. I'm not sure when you would ever need it, but perhaps if you're in an airport and need to look up something from Wikipedia and don't have full internet access, this might be uh, something you could do. This is by uh, David Ledbetter. I think that's how you pronounce his name. Sorry if I got that wrong, David. Uh, this is a great, great example. Uh, blogging over DNS. Um, this is a great system where you can publish a TXT record which then publishes, in air quotes, uh, a blog post. You can list uh, the posts that are there, and you can read a specific post by querying a, a specific record. Eric Ackman um, created uh, this <laughs> tool, I suppose you could call it, called Iodine, um, which is a full implementation of IP over DNS. It's IPv4 only inside the tunnel, and um, but the server can listen to IPv6. Um, basically, you run a, a, a server and a client, and then the client can interact with the server, but via DNS. It's pretty cool. It's called Iodine, uh, which I like because it has the atomic number of 53. There's also uh, an implementation here of HTTP over DNS. Um, this is called Browser Tunnel by Jesse Lee, who's Veggie Defender on GitHub. Um, and yeah, it's, <laughs> I, I think this is maybe going a bit too far, although I would have said that if I hadn't seen some of the other things. Um, and it raises the interesting idea of HTTP over DNS over HTTPS, uh, which is um, an interesting concept and uh, probably should be explored more. Lastly, I think there's a, uh, something I haven't actually checked out. It's an Android app called Slow DNS. Uh, this contains ads, I should warn. Uh, it's in the Google App Store, and it allows you to use DNS, uh, or use the internet from if you have access to DNS. It's, an actual, it's like a VPN, and it works uh, through DNS, which is, I think, could have real uses. Um, especially as I've been traveling a bit recently in the airport, so I'm going to try it when I go, um, go back tomorrow. Oh, sorry, not finally. Um, there's also a tool out there called DNS Cat 2, uh, the successor to DNS Cat 1, I imagine, uh, by Lagox86 on GitHub, or Ron. It doesn't need a domain, and it works the same way as Iodine in that you have a server and a client. It's really interesting because um, it looks exactly like a normal DNS server, you can set it up anywhere you like, and it can tunnel basically anything, any kind of um, uh, data, or it can send signals, it's got messaging. Um, it's 
got a lot of potential uses, I think, especially in the malware world, um, where it's already being, or something like this is already being kind of used um, to exfiltrate data, send beacons, that kind of thing. Um, and it's very hard to detect, I think, because it, it does um, as much as it can to look like just normal DNS traffic. So some of the other things that I came across, sorry. Um, Corey Quinn, who's um, hilarious, by the way, as uh, Quinny Pig on Twitter, he has suggested using Route 53 for config management. Um, so I think actually there is a proof of concept out there where um, it's entirely everything uh, that, that you do on a standard intranet for uh, configuration management you can do via Route 53 and have a system that works on top of that. Um, he posted it as a, a kind of thought experiment, I think, at the time, but um, I think some people have gone ahead and done something like that. There's also something out there called BIMI, which I, uh, when I did this, put this talk together originally, I thought it was kind of crazy, but it's, kind of, it's come back. Really, all it is is uh, just uh, a bunch of TXT records which un uh, start with the underscore BIMI. And it's all to do with brand indicators. So when you receive an email, there's a, a lookup done uh, under the, the underscore BIMI dot logo, I think, something like that. And you get a logo back. And it's a way of kind of um, showing that you're from a verified sender with a, a logo and that kind of thing. I wasn't sure how successful that would be, but it's still around. So maybe more successful than I thought. Uh, another way, another thing that somebody did is a contacts database. There's um, a site called numprotocol.com and a, a company in the UK called Num Technology, which uh, has implemented a full uh, version of the UK Yellow Pages um, on uh, via DNS, and it's basically just a big uh, contacts directory. And I, I'm not sure this kind of thing seems to. Um, because it's piggybacking on other people's infrastructure, I think it's kind of unfair because it's going to be very fast and very quick uh, and very reliable, but it's using um, these Anycast networks which other people have set up. And um, yeah, I'm, I think it's, they maybe should be, um, if it succeeds, then maybe we'll be start to, uh, to get blocked. But it's interesting. And DNSKV.com is a full implementation of a key value store done over DNS. Uh, I would, this is really interesting, and it's got some great documentation. I'm not sure who is behind this. I've been trying to credit the people uh, who created these things as I've been going along. Um, this is, it's actually very cool. It's persistent. It works across um, different networks. Uh, it's got a, a full kind of KV uh, functionality and um, is actually something I think I might use uh, for my own personal data. Um, ben Cox from benjojo.co.uk has also implemented something called DNSFS, which is a full file system that works over DNS. Again, it's persistent and it has a, a cache and it can it works with uh, TXT records um, and it actually works really well. Um, it's, I, I don't know, when I first started looking at this sort of things after John prompted me, I didn't think that I would come across anything this advanced, but I suppose if you think about it and build from uh, first principles, then you can end up with anything you like, over, and this is a full file system. One of the uses of DNSFS that Ben Cox was even surprised himself to see working was streaming MP3s over DNS. So there's MP3s over a file system which works on DNS um, uh, using DIG. And I think this may be one or two levels of complexity too far, um, but it has been done and um, yeah, is <laughs> amazing as far as I'm concerned. That's pretty much it. Um, a bunch of links at the end here if anybody wants to take a look. I think I've covered everything. Um, I went through it a bit quicker than I expected, so if anybody has any questions. Hi, Nils from DSEC. Hi, Nils. Uh, did you keep any statistics on uh, how many of these services did use DNSSEC? Oh, no, I didn't actually, but that would be a, 
<laughs> a really interesting thing to look into. I think, oh, see, now you've mentioned DNSSEC. I'm going to have to go and see if there are any other toys out there which use DNSSEC, because I think that introduces another level of complexity which can be misused. But yeah, that's another a good subsection. I'm kind of glad that I got through all the slides. I was a bit worried because um, I thought I had 30 minutes, and that's how long it took me last time. And then I tried to sort of rush through it for 20 minutes. Um, but now this just means that I can, next time I do it, I can put more stuff in. There's a whole load of things more. Also, um, if you look on Twitter, I have a pinned tweet, for anybody who uses Twitter, a pinned tweet which is a thread of all these different things there. We've got a question online from Patrick Mevzek. Uh, his question is, why singling out Bimmy as an abuser of TXT records? There are so many other guilty cases. Oh, yeah. No, sorry. There are tons of other things out there as well. I do apologize for seeming to single out Bimmy. Um, it was something that I wasn't familiar with, so it seemed kind of um, shocking to me at the time. But, hi, sorry. We have a question here. Uh, yeah. That's... Uh, oh, that, that's it. <laughs> uh, so, I, I wanted to know... Uh, what angle you had for doing this research? Uh, did you do this research? Uh, sorry, so I'm Pallavi. Uh, um, uh, did you do this research uh, from a security point of view or trying to find something that is bad from security standpoint? No, it, it was purely for fun. <laughs> I, uh, it was after a conversation where John suggested, as a joke, that people might be distributing malware uh, via DNS as a kind of you know, file distribution system. Uh, which I thought, ha oh, nobody would do that. Oh, dear, they probably are. And then we started talking about other things. So it was really just for love. There are some interesting techniques that are used in, um, that can be used for, for um, uh, in malware. Um, and I probably should split them up, but uh, yeah. Yeah, because there are, sometimes we get some issues which are related to subdomain takeover or something like that. So I was thinking whether you are doing from that perspective to find different ways people can exploit DNS. Yes, from. actually, as part of the DNS abuse SIG for FIRST, what we're working on is um, uh, an incident and technique taxonomy. So we look into all the different um, types of DNS abuse that cover things like DNS beaconing, DNS exfiltration, um, all these kind of tunneling techniques. And um, so if you want to... Join the SIG. Uh, yeah. Outside members are welcome as well if anybody wants to check it out. So, Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Uh, another question online from Rick Wilhelm. Uh, when doing this research, did you get a sore neck from shaking your head? <laughs> uh, yes, I did. Okay. Uh, actually, a, a question that I'll ask um, is, uh, given the, a lot of these tools seem to be one query, one response, meaning that they're not useful for any other respondents, this is a subjective question. Um, should these kind of things be encouraged or discouraged? I think, in general, experimenting with protocols is fun and should be encouraged. Every protocol that I've ever come across, as soon as it's been, you know, started to be used for real, it starts to be misused, which is just human nature. But I think there's a point at which these things go a bit too far. I mentioned it earlier, referred to it, where I think that once you start to build a company that's based on technology which enables you know, a, a fully distributed, hierarchical, highly available, incredibly fast uh, protocol that's using other people's money that they've uh, used to build these networks, that's a bit too much. But then those people have the option of blocking these things so that, you know, when it becomes a point that um, a drain on their resources. So in general, yes, but uh, there is a limit. Okay. Any other questions? Not seeing anything. All right. So thank you, Peter. Thanks, guys. Um, so thank you to both speakers. Um, we'll now have a break of 30 minutes. Uh, we'll be restarting at uh, 1520 UTC or 1120 Eastern. I'd like another, uh, to make another announcement here. Pallavi is going to be setting up a table at lunch today for women at OARC um, for in-person women attendees and allies. If you'd like to find her and meet with her, that would be great. Um, thanks again to the Workshop and Connectivity sponsor Comcast and the 2022 Workshops patron VeriSign. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Welcome back uh, to session two of day two. Um, 
Uh, I'm John Todd, and we'll be doing this uh, format is going to be slightly different than the rest uh, in the uh, conference, where we're going to be doing a vendor discussion panel and an overview. So this is going to be an hour and 15 minute long session, um, the first hour of which is going to be taken up by four of the different open source uh, vendors of uh, DNS software, giving a brief update of what they've done in the last year and what some of their upcoming ideas are. Each of them is going to have about 12 minutes to give the overview, which is unfortunately a little rushed, but that's the kind of time we have. And then a three-minute section after each one for Q&A from the audience, both online and in, here in person. After that, we'll have about a 15-minute discussion um, talking about general questions. And so uh, I'll do some introduction questions, but also take any suggestions from the audience through Mattermost on uh, panel discussion issues. So without any further delay, um, Benno, you would like to come up and start. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, Benno Ovrander from uh, NLNet Labs. Um, thank you. Yeah. Welcome. Uh, Benno Ovrander, uh, chief cook, bottle washer of, uh, at uh, NLNet Labs with the interest in DNS and, and routing. Um, good. So the vendor update of our NS, uh, DNS software. So <clears throat> as you might know, we have an authoritative and a recursor at NLNet Labs, NSD and Unbound. First, we go through the latest features and the, strat well, the strategic decisions we make for NSD, the authoritative name server. You're a little tall, the microphone's a little Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I will <laughs> lower my, not only lower my voice, but lower my face. Um, NSD, recent results. So what we what we're thinking about NSD, um, as a product for the industry and how it can be useful. NSD is a name server, authoritative name server, robust, stable, uh, but doesn't do DNSSEC signing and won't do that in the future. But still, we wanted to bring it closer to the provisioning systems. So we were thinking about what is useful for the industry and how can it be used in different scenarios than a very fast secondary name server. Um, so, but still, primary focus of NSD is uh, stability and performance because that is what it does very well. Um, besides the strategic decisions and things we think about, uh, of course we keep up with the latest ITF standards. So in the past years, past year, we implemented extended DNS errors, uh, service binding, HTTP, S, sorry, uh, the interoperable or the DNS cookies, very useful. Uh, Puneet presented yesterday about the value of DNS cookies. So. Um, and also uh, XOT, so DNS uh, zone transfer over TLS. Uh, so we keep up with a so lot of development is driven by RFCs and standards, of course. Good. Other thing, features we released recently in the past month is iXphere out. So NSE could receive incremental zone transfers, but that not couldn't forward them. So uh, there was always a full zone transfer to the next uh, name server. So we now have also an incremental zone transfer out. It's a kind of a best effort, or kind of, it's a best effort. So it, it has some history of ix for ints uh, and we'll assemble that, but there's a limit. At some point, you just receive an AXVR instead of the, an, an, an aggregated AXVR. Uh, but with that, we got also, into, well, not introduced, released an interesting feature, and we called, that was formerly known as Credence, uh, zone verification. So you can do, it's, you see it on the, on the picture here, there's a hidden prim primary, uh, so where the zone is, can be signed, for example, well, for example, where the zone is signed. It's sent to via regular IXVR or AXVR to a verifying NSD, and that will load the zone, spawn a process, and that can be queried locally by an external process. That can be LDNS verify zone or zone for it, but it can also be a resolver like bind, power, uh, power recursor, uh, not rec resolver, or, uh, or unbound. So it, you can use different tools. We deliberately chose not to do the verification ourselves, so the operator can choose between different tools. Uh, to verify this, the validity of a zone. And if all boxes are green, uh, an IXVR out is sent to the public facing uh, name service. So that can be some nice bump in the wire feature you can use. Good. 
other th plans for next year, for this year, next year? Well, we have a number of performance features, uh, improving uh, zone parsing and zone loading, especially for the large zones. It can take up to 10, 20, 30 minutes. Um, we are exploring or prototyping uh, new data structures. Traditionally, we're using red black trees and Redux tree. Red black is more memory efficient, Redux tree more time efficient, and adaptive Redux tree is a combination of both. Uh, somewhat, uh, well, somewhat more memory efficient and performant. Uh, we were also experimenting with Express Data Path support, XDP, but more augmenting NSD with that, so kind of a process in front of it for the DNS cookies, for example, or for uh, rate limiting, response rate limiting, but now also want to internalize this protocol in NSD. Um, for the provisioning, catalog zones is in the process, so it's work soon to be, wor uh, soon, working group last call, the catalog zones draft in DNS op, and um, also something on the roadmap is DNS over quick. Uh, DOT is already supported. Uh, the probing signaling is not there yet, but we have good hopes that the current uh, unilateral probing draft in Deep Life uh, will reach the finish line. Thank you, Paul, <laughs> and the other authors, uh, DKG and Joey. Unbound, how doing time-wise? Good, Suzanne, time-wise, still good? Okay, cool. Uh, again, for Unbound, we have, of course, the regular RFCs, standards development, but also think, where is Unbound being used and where can it be useful? So, this, the Unbound resiliency is kind of ongoing process. You get reports by users, there are CVEs, yeah, so some of them you have already seen in our release notes, yeah, just, uh, operational behavior of uh, number of C names. Is it uh, how, how far, how many C names do I have? Can I follow or must unbound follow until it becomes a DDoS factor? That kind of things. Um, so we think about that, but also in enterprise, there's different requirements than others. So RPZ has been introduced in the past, and we extended the number of triggers this winter. I think we had a release with additional triggers. Uh, we have something like view per interface. It's not exactly views, it's more limited, more specific. And ACLs, uh, access lists, access control lists per interface. Very useful for big enterprises, how to direct their queries to different instances, internal resolving, external resolving, etc. And of course, resolvers, you know, are, well, CDNs and cloud providers are really heavily depending on resolvers. So there are also different, a resolver in the CDN or in the data center is something else than a resolver that's trying to resolve names over the world or through the world. They want to have this either cache hit or the nearest name server maybe in the data center, most likely. So it is all has to be fast, fast, fast. So we have made also some kind of changes to Unbound to facilitate that. Recent results, Zone MD, presented yesterday also by, by Dwayne. Uh, service binding support, uh, something, some optimizations for DOT, so we call that uh, stream reuse. So when you do some queries upstream, it will o keep the stream open and also out of order processing on the stream for DOT. So that's a performance improvement for DOT. And recently also extended DNS errors in Unbound. Good, roadmap for the future, for the next year. Uh, under development, we are now implementing DNS over Quick for the client side downward. It's in GitHub. You can look for a feature uh, Git uh, feature branch. Sorry. Um, also ne uh, soon, proxy protocol version two. It's useful in combination, for example, with DNS dist. So you get the, the client IP address via DNS dist via proxy protocol at Unbound. So for ECS and other kind of uh, uh, information you might want to be in or you're interested in. ACL per interface, I already mentioned that. DNS cookies and DNS error reporting that has been implemented during the ITF. This, uh, this, this ITF during the hackathon is currently the happy path, uh, working on it to get it somewhere released later this year. Future work, DOQ upstream to the Again, the unilateral probing is important here. 
we think Prometheus uh, metrics are useful. It's, it's the way, kind of the standard, industrial standard, to get some monitoring data and statistics of your system. We now have proprietary uh, commands to get statistics from Unbound, but I think uh, community is better served with uh, standards. Yeah, thank you. And DNS views, the generic one. We have a pull request, it's a big one. We, st we have reviewed it, but we still have to plan this DNS views uh, well, to be integrated in a release. It's, it's there in the GitHub, you have, can have a look at it. That's it. Oh, we have two minutes for questions, for specific development plans or comments. Okay, but maybe Libor and uh, Vladimir can use that. Um, and otherwise, we have the, the panel discussion uh, at the end of the session. Cool. Thank you. Great. Let me verify with Matt. Are we good to do the remote yeah. for uh, Vladimir? Great. Okay. Maybe I still have one minute, 30 seconds. A <laughs> lot of our developments, you can find it in our on our blog. So it's blog.nlnetlabs.nl. And we also have a newsletter. We keep the community informed about these kind of new features we develop and things we're thinking about. So visit our blog uh, for news or uh, subscribe to the newsletter. Thanks. Thank you, Benno. Um, sorry. Next up uh, from CZ, uh, or Nick.CZ, sorry, uh, is uh, Lubor Peltan and Vladimir Chunat. Um, and we're going to be doing half of this remotely. So, uh, Libor, you are first, yes. Uh, and then uh, the other half will be done by uh, Vladimir. Uh, and hopefully that's all going to go right. <laughs> well, thank you. Hello, I'm Libor Peltan. I will be talking about the news in the autorotative not DNS, and immediately following will be my colleague Vladimir Chunat, who will tell you something about the news in not resolver. So let me start with the autorotative server. Yeah, we keep uh, releasing new versions in a yearly schedule, so it's usually at the end of the summer. You can expect the next release 3.2 in like a next month. Uh, we keep uh, supporting our releases uh, for roughly two years. So if you use the distribution repositories, for example, from Debian or Red Hat, there are probably pretty old versions that are not, no longer supported. So we encourage everyone to use our own repositories where there are always uh, the latest versions available. Yeah, in the last years, we really focused on performance and the XDP technology helps us a lot. So for the basic DNS over UDP, which is the most common case, the XDP is already stable. It's been used by some companies and they are happy with that. Regarding the fallback to TCP, the XDP TCP is still under development. It improves in the next version. It uh, shall bring the resilience against denial of service attacks and other resource exhaustion attacks for public facing servers. But uh, yeah, it has the limitation that uh, it does not implement outgoing congestion control, so it's not recommended to use it for outgoing zone transfers. Anyway, I am not aware that uh, anyone would use it s yet. It's maybe because the, the users are simply not uh, really scared about such attacks <laughs> that it shall mitigate. So once they will, it's ready for them. And XDP and quick over XDP is be is going to be released as well, the first usable version. And this includes the utilities that can debug, uh, KDIC and KXDP GAN. I talked about this uh, in the yesterday's talk. Yeah, we also focus on our users. Uh, many of them operate quite many zones, like hundreds of thousands of zones. And this operation of such many zones on one server has uh, many operational quirks, and they really need uh, our software to work, work like a charm and also support them. Even tiny details when it goes to 100 of thousand zones really matters, so we keep uh, 
adding or slightly improving some, some functionality and features for them. Next topic is catalog zones. This is also improved in the like, last three versions. I guess we are the first software that uh, completely implemented uh, consumption and generation of uh, catalog zones. We also implemented the group property and it seems already pretty usable. We have users of this and we are happy to cooperate in, on this feature with all the other vendors. We cooperate on the ITF and we also cooperate uh, like in our channels. So I'm happy that we cooperate on this. And there are many other, many more other features that we implemented in the last version. And uh, I must admit that when the next version is coming, I look through the change log and I think, yeah, this, this release is really the one that is a milestone that there are so many new things. But this happens repeatedly every year with every new release. So 3.2 will not be an exception and uh, there are quite many things to look forward. For example, the memory consumption in when processing the big changes, big change set to big zone improved like a twofold and uh, yeah, and small helpers that can help anyone. So let's hand over to Vladimir who will talk, who will tell you about not resolver. Uh, so, uh, so I chose some, some subset of uh, notable changes in a not resolver in the past uh, year or two. There's uh, the first thing is about uh, name server choice. The, what is it? So in many situations that there are multiple options, what a resolver can do when resolving a client's query, which is um, usually ask one of the IP addresses of a name server set, or even uh, continue discovering some of those addresses. And the original algorithm that we had in there was very magical. And in some edge cases, it uh, made choices that we did not like at all. So that around a year ago, it was rewritten and released. And the um, main kind of visible result or measurable result is that uh, we can get a bit better latency on cache misses due to the choices being a bit better usually just to service that answer faster due to being closer and consequently using fewer packets due to change to retransmission strategy a part of this is uh, also that the decisions could be better thanks to now sharing these stats uh, among our single threaded processes that uh, compose of the service. Okay, so that's what rewriting, uh, choosing of name servers. And let's have a look at the next slide. Uh, the okay, <laughs> so we changed uh, our uh, thinking around assertions. Uh, so that is so uh, when we encounter some um, inconsistency in some of our checks, 
so that, that's internal inconsistency. That, that means if we found this, uh, it means uh, we run into some bug of ours, not due to uh, unexpected behavior of servers, but our bad code. And there uh, we often had a dilemma what to do about it. Uh, because one major option is to abort uh, this process because that allows us to get more information. The generated core dump, assuming uh, the user will be sharing uh, the core dump with us, it, it's often very helpful in fixing these bugs. And, and um, yeah. Other major choice is to try recovering from the situation because usually we can uh, judge that the disturbance um, in the state only affects a single request. So we can just, in the worst case, surfail the single request, but continue with everything else undisturbed. And it uh, turned out that we can actually simply do both of these at once uh in the way that uh, we fork the child immediately aborts to generate the core dump and parent process recovers so uh users can do this since uh, recent release okay next slide please and we also restructured our logging. Uh, 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 one, uh, well, rewritten how it looks, so it's a bit more uniform, but also edit uh, meta metadata so that uh, the logger can filter based on uh, priorities of these logs and even contain uh, in system decays contain extra position of the, the origin of the log like source line and yeah and logging groups that is uh, uh, the, the, the bad logs are generally extremely verbose so users can choose to debug just some subsystems of uh, not resolver okay so the Next, final slide. And there are also lots of many changes that uh, I did not mention, but some other notable small changes is that we now do extended DNS error codes, uh, trying to choose the one that fits most the particular situation, because often it's not clear at all or we have uh, some code for zone MD verification uh, in our root profiling code, but that can't be, or we didn't choose to activate it yet because uh, the, the record is not there yet in the root. So, but we can do that quickly uh, when that happens. And we edit support for proxy v2 so that's uh, good to preserve uh, the IP address of the client behind the reverse proxy in case you use it and, uh, and use, of course, that is what is then used in ACLs and, and such things. So, okay, I think that's about it. complicated for this. Um, so with that, now we have Echo. Um, we'll move on to uh, Peter Van Dyke uh, with PowerDNS Open Exchange. Okay, I am on. Uh, thank you. Hello, my name is Peter Van Dyke. I'm an engineer at PowerDNS. Uh, I will be going over a couple of the things we've been doing for the last 12 to 14 months because it's been a while since we gave such an update. Uh, slide two, please. 
Okay. Um, one general thing, as many of you, many of you might know, uh, Unix time T used to be 32 bits, and this will run out in 2038. To mitigate any trouble arising from that, we have decided to only allow our software to compile on platforms with a 64-bit time T since somewhere last year, depending on which uh, product got a release when. Uh, this means we currently do not ship current software for 32-bit Debian, Red Hat, etc. Uh, however, Alpine, OpenWRT, and various other distributions that are more current with their uh, C libraries do still run our software with a 64-bit time T on the 32-bit platform. Uh, and we are hoping that Debian 12 and maybe Red Hat 10, when it comes out, so I guess it will be a while, uh, will allow us to ship for those 32-bit platforms again as well. Uh, last year, CentOS 8 went end of life quite suddenly. Uh, we have decided to switch our builds for that to Oracle Linux at the time because Rocky and Alma, et cetera, were not mature yet. We might revisit this change later. Uh, we have done a bunch of experiments and testing regarding binary compatibility. Uh, and it appears that all of these Red Hat derivatives are quite compatible. Uh, we've seen minor differences in libraries, but nothing major. Uh, at the last org, I think Niels presented uh, an implementation of Falcon 512, a post-quantum uh, algorithm in PowerDNS. Um, we are looking forward to see what NIST will decide, what the DNS community will decide. Uh, but we were very happy to see that it was very easy to implement a new algorithm in PowerDNS. Uh, besides all that, we've been working over all our products to uh, make embedded deployment easier. So on systems like OpenWRT systems with only 60, 100 megabytes of RAM. Uh, and we hope to in the future see DNS disk run on some home routers like DNS mask and not resolver are doing now. Slide three, please. Uh, PowerDNS recursor is probably the product where we see the uh, biggest addition of new features over every release. Last year, we added aggressive NSEC, uh, eDNS zero padding to clients. We enabled DNSic validation by default. We had validation for quite some time already, defaulting to only when clients request it. But with this version, we were confident about enabling it by default, both in terms of the quality of our implementation and the general quality of DNSic deployments on the internet. Uh, we added extended error support, support for refetching things that almost expire, assuming they are being queried. Outgoing TCP fast open was quite interesting. Uh, Otto ended up writing a blog post about that. Uh, Google ended up fixing some things in their stack there on the outside. Uh, and finally, there was a tsunami issue, which we were not vulnerable to, but we did find that we could do better in terms of remembering name servers that were not cooperating. Next slide, please. Uh, in December, we did another recursor release. We uh, do releases every six months for our three major products. Uh, one thing that I find very cute is that some people have their out deployments between which they use notifying zone transfers to transfer updated zones. Uh, and then you have recursor that's running in your network, or at least is being used by your network, but it is out of date. So Recurso can also flush uh, data for a zone when it receives a notify, there is an ACL for that, etc. We enabled a DNS of TLS to authoritatives. In 4.6, this was still strictly manual configuration. Uh, and along with that, we added connection reuse for TCP and TLS, because especially with TLS, if you don't reuse your connections, Things get ex extensive quite quickly. Inspired by how not resolver is doing this, we added, added a zone to cache feature that will periodically take a zone from some source and insert everything that's in that zone into the cache, uh, which is roughly an implementation of local routes, but with some sm small minor differences. Next slide. In 4.7 released quite recently, 
uh, we added some support for giving clients additional records, uh, such as IP phones that might get some SRV or NAPTA records. They would love to also get some A records with that. Uh, and assuming things are in cache, 4.7 users can ship those records to their users. We uh, updated our QNA minimization implementation to the recommendations in the new RFC version. We now actively go out to fetch IPv6 glue before we're quite lazy about that, uh, which means we now get more name server IPs to choose from based on speeds. And generally we will be using IPv6 more. Uh, one thing that we are very excited about is unilateral dot probing. Sadly, DeepRive uh, has not been able to reach any consensus on an actual signal. So there's a draft now for, for probing and we have implemented something in the spirit of it, not necessarily to the letter. And finally, the zone to cache feature introduced in the previous version can now validate zone MD. Next slide, please. Uh, the authoritative is not nearly growing features as fast as the recursor, but there are still some. In 4.5, we grew a zone name cache. Uh, so I'll explain what that means. PowerDNS tends to be database backed. Sometimes it's SQL, sometimes it's something fast and local. Uh, and your server may also get a lot of requests for zones you don't host at all. With this cache, we periodically fetch a list of zones from the database and remember that nothing outside of that set exists. Uh, besides that, we got a priority ordering for the incoming zone transfer queue because our signature refreshes, which happen every Thursday, were sometimes drowning out actual changes that people cared about. Next slide, please. Uh, in 4.6, we got incoming proxy v2 support. I saw Paul asking what that was. I know Puneet answered him, but I will answer for the benefit of the rest of the audience. If you run a setup with a, a server, let's say an authoritative, and you have something like DNS dist in front or some other proxy or load balancer, the authoritative no longer sees the actual client IPs. With the proxy protocol, DNS dist when talking to the backend like the authoritative will prepend a small header that shares that information, allowing the authoritative to make decisions based on the actual client IP. And the same goes when the recursor is behind DNS dist. And I am very happy to see that many of the vendors have now agreed that proxy v2 is the right protocol for this uh, after previously failed drafts in the ITF like XPF. Uh, we added EDNS cookie support according to the latest document, the latest RFC. Uh, so these should be interoperable with the other vendors. And we changed the default N63 parameters uh, according to the draft by Wes and Victor, I think, which was discussed yesterday. Next slide, please. Uh, in Authority Server 4.7, which we hope to release within, say, a month, we expect to ship an implementation of catalog zones. It is finished. Uh, many people have uh, commented on the code already. We are doing a bit more testing, and I actually hope to merge it and release an alpha version later this week. Next slide. Then there's DNS dist, our low balancer proxy front end, et cetera. Uh, also quite often used in front of other name servers that are not power DNS. Last year, we released out of order processing, proxy v2 support, both incoming and outgoing. Uh, and those who use DNS dist might know that you can write policies uh, for load balancing in Lua before this version those all ran in a single thread limiting performance starting with this version you can write those policies as a bit of lua that runs separately in several threads at the same time uh, and also we made the packet cache cookie blind which aids debugging a lot because many users were seeing um cached results from DNS dist, and then you as the operator go and test with dig, which sends cookies, and you get something fresh. Um, so with the cache being cookie blind, the dig experience matches the user experience slightly more, slightly closer. Uh, and also this does just saves a lot of memory and improves the cache hit ratios. Next slide. 
In 1.7, released earlier this year, we now support connecting to upstreams over DOT and DOH. DNS dist already supported serving clients via DOT and DOH. Um, we can now send truncated responses via XDP based on policies also defined in Lua. Okay, two minutes left. Um, DNS dist, oh, previous slide, please. Uh, the DNS disk can now itself serve SVCB or HTTPS records for clients that want to upgrade from DO53 to DOT or DOH. Previously, you would need to point, need to put an out or recursor behind the DNS disk to serve those records. Uh, and in 1.7, we get luckless custom actions in Lua, which is a similar story to the luckless low balancing policies in 1.6. Uh, that was my last slide. Uh, finally, I would like to add that. DNS dist is a Google Summer of Code program this year, and we are expecting outcoming the outgoing DOQ to come to us through that. Uh, and we hope that shortly after that, we will also be able to offer incoming DOQ, uh, do DOQ from recurse or to outs, etc. Thank you. Then I see I have one question. NIST, Victor Dukovny asks, NIST warns that Falcon is difficult to implement correctly. I am guessing you're using the reference implementation of the underlying crypto. Um, the implementation was done by Niels and friends, and I know Niels is in the room with you, so maybe he can answer at some opportune time. I think I'm the last. Uh, Vicky from uh, ISC, uh, there are a number of other folks here from ISC, uh, including Mark, so if you have any difficult questions, I'll get him to answer those. So um, this is a, a, a Twitter post that uh, Andre found, and I think that uh, he sometimes feels like this is his role in by 9 you know, uh, vacuuming the vast uh, uh, desert of uh, tech debt in, um, in by nine. I, however, see it completely differently. Um, this is, uh, 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 to my mind, represents our really strong uh, QA team that we have. We have now built up a, a, a team of four really talented uh, test engineers. So this is now almost one QA person to every two developers in the bind team. This is stuff that you don't see in the release notes and you wouldn't know otherwise, but we have really substantially beefed up our test capability in the past few years. Our uh, continuous integration runs a huge suite of tests. It's more than 70 tests on every version of every merge request. And um, we're constantly adding new tests when I asked right when I was producing these slides. Uh, uh, Mikhail Kepian described to me a new test that we put together to find memory leaks. In addition, every day the QA team runs additional tests that run on a daily basis, including uh, RESP diff, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Um, obviously, it's easy to run a lot of tests. The difficulty comes in finding the time to actually look at the test failures and figure out uh, what sort of problem you have. And that's something that we really focus on with the monthly snapshot releases. Um, uh, we have had for years uh, uh, an authoritative performance test bed that Ray Bellis designed, Perf Lab. And last year, uh, Peter Spotchak built us a uh, performance test bed for resolver testing. And we run that on an ongoing basis and check that also with the monthly releases. One thing we haven't been able to do until recently is do stress testing with uh, high loads of TCP traffic, and that's something that we're working on right now. Uh, RESP diff, for anyone who doesn't know, is just what it sounds like. It looks at uh, different responses from different resolvers. Right now, we're comparing NAMD with the NOT Resolver 551, Unbound 1131, and PowerDNS Recursor 459. And we have set a ratio of a half a percent, and if we see more than a half a percent of discrepancies between bind and the other three, we consider that maybe there's an error in bind. Um, the way that this is calculated, though, all three of the other implementations have to have one answer, and then bind returns a different answer. 
if everybody has a different answer, we don't consider that's a blind error. I just looked at one of the most recent jobs, and typically, a typical uh, result is that almost exactly a third of a percent of the time, you get a different answer with name D than with the other three systems. This, I think, is pretty impressive agreement because buried in this one third of a percent, almost 40% of those are timing differences. And we're running these tests on the open internet. As you all know, if you run the same test, the subsequent um, runs of the exact same test with the exact same uh, software, same queries, you will get timing differences. Uh, Andre wanted to make sure that I mention that uh, 918, which is our current stable branch, is quite a bit faster than 916. Um, I went through the results, and I have to say for authoritative, it's about the same. Uh, but for recursive, in fact, uh, we, we do have a pretty good performance improvement. This is a, a relatively complicated chart. But anyone who's seen one of Peter Spotcheck's uh, presentations on resolver testing might recognize it. Uh, the scale is logarithmic on each axis. On the uh, vertical axis, that's the response time. And across the bottom, uh, it is the percentile of queries that are responded to. And basically, the orange line is 918. The blue line is 916. Um, farther to the left is better. 4% um, of the queries uh, sent by 918 were answered in less than 10 milliseconds, and there were five times as many queries that took that long or longer with 916. Um, we're not just uh, obviously testing and fixing bugs. For a long time, we have had a program of continuous refactoring in BIND, and this year and next year, we're focusing on the Red Black Tree database. Um, some of you know that uh, Tony Finch joined ISC earlier this year, and he is uh, taking the lead in tackling this project. The main thing that we're trying to accomplish is uh, code simplification for the development team. Uh, but of course, at the same time, we're trying to make sure that we're not uh, incurring a performance penalty, we're not slowing down bind, we're not chewing up more memory. The main thing that users will see as a benefit, we hope, is reduced blocking so that when you're doing large zone transfers, you don't inhibit the uh, responsiveness of bind at the same time. Um, Tony invented this uh, QP tree data structure back in 20, uh, I think it was actually before 2015, but in any case, I know that the not DNS team implemented, implemented that or a version of that in 2016. Tony's done experiments with NSD since then, and uh, he's continued to improve this. Um, his focus has been on uh, reducing the memory, looking at lots of different compression techniques, improving the multi-threading, and uh, the, improving the multi-version concurrency. And that is, again, so that you can have uh, one version that you're updating at, while you're serving the information from another version. And he's got. Uh, what sounds like a conservative plan for replacing the RBTDB in stages. And again, this is, of course, going to happen in our experimental development version. He has some very early test data. Um, in the small print there, I've got a link to his blog where he blogs about his progress. Um, this is very promising. So far, he has uh, been able to achieve some performance improvements and significantly cut back on the memory uh, requirement. Um, it's not merged yet. Uh, we're expecting he's going to be merging it this fall. Uh, we are, of course, working on a lot of other projects. I don't have a long list of every feature we've added in the last uh, year or year and a half. Um, we started on extended errors in 918. We're adding more extended errors in the current development branch. Um, the, our catalog zones update to the 06 draft should be in the next monthly snapshot. Um, uh, we are sponsoring an external uh, contractor to work on an open SSL 3.0 PKCS11 uh, provider engine because the APIs changed since last 
the last version. Um, our engineer who has been working on the new transports who implemented our DO and DOT support is actually already refactoring. And this is because he realized that we had uh, uh, support for TCP, support for TCP DNS, support for DNS over TLS, and a lot of uh, changes were having to be repeated in each of those three completely separate transports. Uh, so he's trying to unify them. And he's also, of course, keeping an eye on the uh, status of uh, the quick implementations out there. Uh, we're also planning to use the uh, NGTCP2 library that uh, Libor discussed, and we're very grateful that he's doing the experiment so we can learn from that. Um, another thing we're doing, which is not really a release note item, we've, we're starting to put a lot of work into the arm, as Suzanne Goldlust, who's here this, this uh, O-Work, also has been working on that. And we've recruited Ron Atchison, who many of you may remember from the Pro DNS and Bind books and the Zytrax website uh, to help us out uh, in making the ARM more user friendly and provide more uh, description of what commands you might want to actually look into. Um, uh, he pushed us in particular, and Pater did, uh, Pater Spacek did a lot of this work actually, um, but he pushed us so that. Um, now everywhere where we mention a command in the arm, it links directly to the command reference. And uh, we also have added categories for all the commands so you can find all the categories related to a particular function. Um, in fact, we're also planning to add a category we haven't yet, but something along the lines of caution or expert or <laughs> don't use this command unless you're sure you know what you're doing. Um, we haven't made any decision on this, but we have started having some internal discussions about should we uh, uh, become more parent-centric. So it feels like uh, it's a lot of work to constantly be checking with the child and uh, 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 determining what to do if the child is not updated. Um, and we have an open GitLab issue if people want to comment on that. As I said, it's just uh, something we're discussing internally. And um, this is our current status. The current stable version is 9.18. We came out with that in January. That will be our stable branch for two years. We switched to a two-year cycle with the 9.18 version. Um, in summary, we have better recursive performance. We have better uh, memory usage. Um, this is the release that has the stable deployable versions of DOH, DOT, transfers over TLS, dig is updated, so we have a dig plus TLS option. Um, we have, of course, the uh, key and signing policy uh, tool in there, which we're continuing to improve. Support for OpenSSL 3.0. Uh, we're adding extended errors, and we have um, continued a program of gradually deprecating uh, features that we feel are obsolete. Um, one of the biggest things that we deprecated in 918 was support for Windows. Um, this, uh, we got some uh, protests on the mailing list, but nobody was interested in picking it up, and it's increasingly hard to support uh, operating systems that um, don't have some of the uh, packages that we rely on uh, in the network area and uh, that are difficult uh, for our recursive uh, continuous integration testing. So that's the end. I've got a few links here, and um, I'll take questions. Um, somebody asked, if, are there any improvements made to cache in 9.18 stale cache especially? I know we did just make a change in, this, in the handling of stale cache in 9.19. I don't know. Mark, do you know if we backported that to 9.18? I know there is a change in um, the, the most recent monthly version of 919. Um, I don't know if we backported it. Uh, I actually think we did. If you can tell me who asked the question, I can follow up later. Priyadashini Mohan? Okay, if you, if you, 
If you check the release notes for the most recent uh, 919 version, and I think it was in the mo in last month's the uh, the June uh, 919 version as well. And this was uh, uh, limiting the uh, maintenance of negative answers in the cache, I think. Okay. So we'll move into the panel discussion part of this. Um, and so uh, we've got, I think, about 15 minutes. Is that right, Suzanne? Roughly? Great. Um, so uh, to kind of kick things off, um, I wanted to ask the panel about Quick. We see a lot of activity now with uh, each one of you said something, or at least, uh, not, actually, that's not true. Some of you have said something about Quick. What's the what's the agenda for Quick? When do you think when do you think that's going to become a production ready um, tool on your platform, or are there plans at all for it? So I guess I'll open up the floor to whoever wants to comment on that first, um, and I'll keep my eye on the channel here to convert audio. Um, yeah. Well, thank you. Oh. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so currently, I think. Like others, we are now developing DNSR for Quick for the, the client side, downside. Um, we expect to release it at the end of this year. Maybe still some experimental code. Uh, but for sure, uh, moving to next year, uh, have, it, have it in production. Um, we didn't start working on DNSR for Quick upstream because, well, with current discussions or progress in, in DeepRive, we have seen four drafts on authoritative uh, DNS over TLS and the, the signaling and the probing. There was not much consensus in the deep drive working group. Now we have an, uh, a draft that can make the finish. Well, I just meant it. We have good hopes it will f reach the finish line. I think that will be the first step to also implement and deploy DOT to the authoritative and DOQ. So it's the same, the probing. Um, so that will be scheduled next year, early next year, and both for Unbound, Upstream, and for the NSD uh, as an authoritative name server. Um, yeah, so I think 2023 we will see both DOQ, uh, Upstream, and uh, client side uh, being available in, in our products. This, as you noticed in my yesterday's and today presentation for not DNS, the Kubik is uh, current topic number one, so we have already implemented this with XDP. It's going to be released soon, and uh, we are going to continue with uh, the like conventional uh, DNS over quick in uh, DNS. I hope that later on my colleagues from Not Resolver will take over this uh, code base to also implement it in the Resolver, but this will be postponed. And also I would like to mention the tools that we have the KDIC implements uh, Quick as well, so you can debug any DNS over Quick server with this utility. And KXDP gun, so you can not only debug it, but also measure its, its performance. So there is much ongoing work, and it's some of it will be released soon, and some of it will be released in the next year, I guess. So it sounds like we are the slowest of the group at doing Quick. Um, uh, I, I like the sound of 2023. Um, I mentioned that we're already doing some refactoring in the uh, transport area. And in our last major stable version, we really we replaced all of the network interface. So uh, we have had quite a lot of change there. Um, and we will be obviously looking at quick when we think that the libraries are mature and are ready. Um, uh, I. I personally question whether just you know, slapping in a new transport is going to provide enough support for a, a, a good, stable new service. And, and maybe it's my limitation, but um, uh, you know, previously we had just UDP and TCP. And um, we have a lot of features that uh, provide, implement quotas, do throttling, um, uh, abuse mitigation features, uh, you know, fall back to TCP. Um, and I'm thinking now when we have so many more choices, uh, what do we do about some of those features? Uh, you know, do we 
ball back to quick instead <laughs> of uh, DNS over TCP? I don't know. Um, our statistics certainly haven't caught up yet with the multitude of transports and some of these things we're not even sure how to count them. Um, you know, is it is a dough? Is it a, a TCP? Is it dough? Is it um, both? Um, so. Uh, I'm happy not to be the very first out of the block mm -hmm. with the quick support. And I will say, even though I know in this audience, everybody's very excited about the new transports among our users, we've seen very little interest in deploying DOT and DO, and uh, very little requests for quick as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. Oh, please go ahead. Yes, and uh, I would like to have a question for my <laughs> co-panelists. If they are interested in zone transfers over quick, uh, I haven't started implementing them yet, but I think this is a really a reasonable feature that the alternative server can offer if they interoperate with the zone transfers mm -hmm. over quick. Yeah, thanks. We'll have a look at it. Maybe a good ITF hackathon project for next year. So, but, so, and I was, Quite interested in your presentation yesterday, also the presentation by Edgard, that the cryptography in Quick is not for free, for sure. And that's that's for for, for nominal uh, users, it's fine, but you said for the, if it goes to the DDoS side, you definitely pay for the encryption. And that's something we should, well, my question to Libra was, is that something with the immaturity of the libraries or is it inherent to the protocol? That's something we have to look at it uh, carefully and uh, all the people here at the table and Peter van Dijk, uh, remote, we are, well, we have a good collaboration. And that I, I want, probably most of you know that already. We do coordinate things, uh, well, co with coding, interop testing, we, uh, we exchange experiences, but we definitely keep out of each other's, each other's code. So we have code diversity. We don't make the same mistakes here. Everybody makes their own mistakes. That's good. Yeah, I, I also was very interested in your yeah. talk yesterday. And I will say that among the people who do ask us about uh, uh, a DOE and DOT, uh, the primary concern is, uh, are we going to blow up their current installations uh, with um, connections that are much more CPU intensive or memory intensive. Mm -hmm. um, the people have an investment in a deployed infrastructure and they want to run these new protocols on that same infrastructure. I'd like to have us cut over to uh, Peter, if we can. Hello there. Um, I briefly mentioned Quick during my talk. Uh, we hope to get outgoing Quick in DNS this, this year. Uh, we hope to add it in every other place. It makes sense after that. Uh, right now, DNS disk uses the H2O library to serve DOH, while we use NGHTP2 to do upstream DOH. Uh, I believe the, all the other vendors are, are also using NGHTP2. Um, so it would be good if we found one or two other competent libraries for that, but I'm not optimistic. Uh, so it looks like we might get some... Um, we might get some common attack surface there, which would be a pity, but I'm not sure it's avoidable. Uh, also, I feel the client side, uh, the client side for Quick is not really coming along yet. Uh, it's not in Android, it's not in browsers, it's not in systemd resolve D. Uh, so I am not sure how useful Quick will be until that happens. That's all for me for now. Okay, great. Uh, cutting back to here. Um, so I guess my next question for the group assembled is that it's been quite a while since we've had uh, a flag day. Um, so I'm interested in what any of you think about uh, what are the things that might be considered as a flag day. Are there anything, is there anything that, that we need to look at? I mean, we shouldn't have a flag day just to have it, right? But there are some things that were useful in the past. Are there any things that you think are useful in the future to consider as a flag day conversion for the vendor and operator community to consider? Who wants to kick off here? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, so I'll just say uh, from my perspective, uh, 
it, flag day is not a magic wand. There are limited things that there are things that we would all like to change out in the DNS, but we can only control how strict we are in what we tolerate. And we have actually made Bind uh, quite a bit stricter in the past couple of years. Uh, we've tightened up our QNA minimization. We, we've tightened up a num number of things. But um, uh, I think um, we would like to see more people deploy uh, cookies. Um, but I don't really see a, uh, a flag day operation that's going to force people to do something like that. Yeah. And um, I think I also I think it's a more effective tool if it's uh, not just a, every October, uh, you know, the open source DNS providers decide to break everything. You know, we have to have a pretty good candidate. And anyway, I personally don't have one in mind. I did ask the question internally and. Um, uh, Mark and some others commented they'd like to see people in, implement 1034 and 1035, but I'm not sure that we could have a flag day that would accomplish that. More anniversary, maybe. Yeah. Can we cut over to uh, Peter, please? Hello. Um, yesterday there was some talk about the new recommendations for NSIC tree parameters. Uh, and some people suggested that that might be worthy of a flag day. Uh, but it is something that we can do quite incrementally, qu can monitor quite well. Uh, the big problems right now are mostly TLD zones. Uh, and Victor is keeping good tabs on that. Uh, so I'm not sure that warrants a flag day. And I agree with Vicky. You can't go around breaking things every year. Uh, besides that, I have seen, and I hope others see that as well, that since the last two flag days, we haven't had many large-scale problems with authoritatives not behaving well. Uh, they're still small-scale things, uh, but they just get fixed. And uh, like Bind, PowerDNS has also gotten stricter with things over time. And we appear to just be getting away with that. Uh, so no, I do not have a concrete idea for a next flag day. Let me just check the workshops channel. Okay, nothing for me. No, yeah, I I remember indeed that I think Wes or Victor reacted on the suggestion and they're working towards the zero iterations, but we're not there yet. So maybe you can come up to the microphone and thought, well, maybe it's not a good candidate for a flag day because we are still in progress to get to the zero. And if we, well, maybe too early to kick off a, a, a DNS flag day on this. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, I mean, it is a good question. The, the, the thing I think that the presentation yesterday was saying that if everybody switched to zero immediately, it would be chaos. Uh, that should not be done. And, and the draft very carefully says that should not be done. A flag day might be helpful if everybody, you know, at the table and virtual agreed, this is the starting value. Right. This, and if you look at Victor's very careful analysis of where things might start breaking, there's some very safe values. If you remember in the discussion in DNSOP in the draft, we started with, let's set it at 100. And then we agreed, no, it should really go to zero over time. And maybe there should be multiple flag days. Right. That's probably the right path forward. We should start with 100 or some agreed upon value. It, it will affect you know, only a few zones and then you know a couple of years go to 50 and a couple of years 10 or something like that and but you know it would take all of you to agree on what that value should be but um, i don't disagree with there should be a flag day but there should probably be like five i don't know thank you and in, oh sorry and, and, and indeed in the past year i think most of the open source developers already decreased the maximum or well the maximum iterations to something like 100. Uh, it might not be officially announced, but it was in the release notes of different uh, resolvers. So maybe implicitly there have been already some DNS flag days without you noticing. And this, that might be good. Victor. Uh, if I may, uh, I just have a question. Oh, wow, echo. Uh, how often do people want to see sort of large surveys redone? 
they take some effort, so I don't want to be doing it once a week. Uh, but, you know, twice a year is viable. More often would take some effort. Uh, but, you know, if, if people don't act on these, you know, in, a, in short time scales, it probably once a year is enough. But if people want to see 19 million domains rescanned tomorrow, let me know. Great. Uh, I think that's our time. Yes. Fantastic. Thank you very much to all the participants of the panel, remote and local. Um, and then a few more housekeeping announcements here. Um, again, we have um, uh, lunch upcoming. Uh, and then uh, actually there's a table. Again, I'll announce the women at OARC table. Um, thank you again to our workshop and connectivity sponsor, which is Comcast, and our 2022 workshops patron, VeriSign. Um, I, unfortunately, I didn't write down the start time of our next session, but I think it's going to be the end of lunch. That'll be fairly obvious. Thank you again to our speakers and panelists, and we'll see you at lunch. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Okay, it looks like we're ready to go. Welcome back, everybody. Um, I'm Suzanne Wolf. I'm on the program committee, and I will be moderating these last couple of sessions. First, we have, is that better? Thanks. And before we go on, um, thanks very much to Comcast as our workshop and, con and connectivity sponsor, and VeriSign as the 2022 workshops patron. Thanks so much for supporting OARC. Now, we are ready with the first talk. Um, Paul Grubbs will be talking about zero knowledge middle boxes. All right. I believe that uh, everybody can hear me and see me now, uh, so I'm just going to go for it. Um, uh, thank you uh, so much to uh, DNS OARC uh, and the program committee for inviting me to share my research uh, uh, today with you. Um, so as Suzanne mentioned, I'm going to talk about zero knowledge middle boxes. Uh, this is some research that I've done recently with uh, with uh, my co-authors Arasu Arun, Ye Zhang, Joseph Deneau, Mike Walfish, Zach DeStefano, and Colin Zhang. Um, so this talk is going to be about resolving a kind of fundamental tension between privacy and, and policy enforcement and networks. Um, so we all know that encryption is now becoming really, really ubiquitous for network traffic. So protocols like TLS 1.3 where the client and the server first perform some kind of a handshake to share a, a cryptographic key and then use it to encrypt their traffic um, are becoming really ubiquitous on the internet. So these protocols hide the contents of traffic, but increasingly they're also being used to hide the metadata of traffic. And one important kind of metadata for this talk is, is DNS queries. Um, so encryption makes the basic task of, of, of enforcing network policies uh, really, really difficult. Um, today, networks use middle boxes, which we can just sort of imagine as any kind of Net, in network device that can perform general purpose computation on, on traffic. Uh, they use these middle boxes to enforce uh, uh, policies by scanning traffic directly. So when a client sends some, some traffic through the network, the middle box sort of scans it and then checks whether it's compliant with the policy. And if it is, then it forwards the traffic. And if it's not, then it sort of blocks the traffic, maybe takes an additional action. Um, so this basic middle box enforcement pattern is used to enforce like dozens and dozens of different kinds of network security policies today. So like data loss prevention, DNS filtering, um, and a lot more. So the, the motivating question of this work is like, can we resolve this, what seems to be a really, really fundamental tension between the privacy offered by encryption for network traffic uh, and a network's ability to enforce uh, policies in their network? So this is a really, really uh, complex and polarizing question. Um, many network administrators would probably argue that encryption should just be disallowed in networks where policy enforcement is needed. Um, whereas uh, people maybe more like me, like cryptographers and privacy advocates would probably say that networks should only enforce policies that don't require actually decrypting uh, traffic. So if we want to resolve this tension and sort of make both parties happy, um, any solution that we come up with should have a few basic requirements. Uh, the first is that we shouldn't really need to weaken encryption. It should be possible to have just as much privacy as we did before, except for sort of letting the network know whether traffic is or is compliant. So the second requirement is that the network should still be able to enforce the policies that they were able to before. And in particular, they should be able to identify and block non-compliant uh, traffic. The third requirement is that 
we shouldn't really require any, any server changes uh, to, to make this protocol deployable. Ideally, it should be the case that the server doesn't even need to know that the protocol is happening. Uh, so we prioritize this because there's a lot of good evidence that changing clients is a lot easier and faster today than changing servers. Uh, so for example, in January of this year, only 51% of TLS servers supported TLS 1.3, which is a four-year-old protocol. Um, in contrast, about 50% of Chrome users already supported Chrome 97, which was only one month old at the time. So it seems like clients are, are, are faster uh, um, to, to update. So to make this deployable, we should prioritize client, client change, but maybe keep servers the way they are. Um, a corollary of this is we also don't want to introduce any additional trust assumptions into our architecture here. So we don't want to have to sort of trust additional TLS certificates or, or introduce trusted hardware that the clients have to run or, or, or things like that. So there's been some academic work on sort of resolving these tensions, but they've all failed to, to meet at least one of these requirements. So some of them use trusted hardware like their SGX base, um, and the others involve changing protocols and also weakening them to sort of allow the networks to do the scanning um, directly on the encrypted traffic. Um, so I just want to mention one non-requirement that we that we kind of articulated in this work. So what we don't want to do is create a tool that can be misused for censorship. So what we want to do is sort of maintain the status quo that exists today um, for, for unencrypted traffic, which is that tech savvy users can use a Tor or a VPN to sort of circumvent the, the blocking, but most people won't uh, uh, do this because we don't want to build something that can sort of be misused for, for censorship. Um, um, so in, in short, what we want is some way for the client to reveal nothing about their plain text traffic to the, to the middle box, except for convincing the middle box that the traffic is policy compliant. Um, and so it turns out that there's a cryptographic primitive that's very well suited uh, to solve this problem for us. And it's called zero knowledge proofs. So it's going to kind of come to our rescue like Superman. Um, so a zero knowledge proof, if you're not familiar, is a cryptographic primitive. Uh, that, that takes place between a prover and a verifier. It allows the prover to convince the verifier of the truth of some public statement uh, in, in a way that has two kind of security guarantees that are important for us. Uh, the first is that the prover doesn't have to tell the verifier why the statement is true. It only needs to convince the verifier, verifier that it is true. So this is a sort of the zero knowledge guarantee. And the second requirement uh, of a guarantee rather of a zero knowledge proof is that the prover can only convince the verifier if the statement is actually true. So this guarantee is called sounds. Uh, concretely, you can think of a, a zero knowledge proof as just being a single message protocol where a prover generates and sends a, a zero knowledge proof, which is like a, just a binary string to a verifier. Uh, and the verifier checks the zero knowledge proof using some kind of special checking procedure um, that outputs true or false. And if it outputs true, then we say that the verifier is convinced of the statement. And if it outputs false, then the verifier is not, not convinced. Um, so with this cryptographic primitive is zero knowledge proof, we're gonna introduce a, a sort of general architecture for solving these kinds of privacy versus policy problems. And we call our architecture a zero knowledge middle box. In a zero knowledge middle box or ZKMB, which I'll use as an abbreviation, the clients are given when they join the network, a description of the policy that the network wants to enforce on their, on their traffic. The clients, then establish keys and communicate using standard encryption protocols like TLS 1.3. But in addition to using these protocols to send their data, they also use a zero knowledge proof protocol to convince the middle box of the truth of the statement, my ciphertext contains compliant traffic. Uh, so they use this zero knowledge proof to act as the prover to sort of convince the middle box as the verifier that even though the verifier can't see this, this underlying plain text traffic, it nonetheless is compliant with the policy that it, that it, that it specified. And finally, the middle box can verify these proofs. And if the proofs don't verify, um, it can just uh, block the traffic, uh, block the connection from the client. And if it does, it can just sort of strip out the proof and, and forward the traffic onto the, onto the destination. So we'll just very quickly uh, check that the three requirements are, are upheld here. Uh, first, uh, the requirement is that we don't weaken encryption. So we, we succeed in this because we just use standard encryption and the zero knowledge property of the zero knowledge proof hides the plain text traffic of the, uh, of the client. So the middle box can still, uh, and the network can still enforce policies. This is enforced by the soundness guarantee of the zero knowledge proof. So the, so the client acting as prover, the soundness guarantee prevents the client from lying about the policy compliance of its traffic. So if the verifier sort of accepts this proof that the, that the client sends, then that means that the, that the traffic actually is, is compliant by soundness. 
And finally, because the, 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 the server doesn't really know about this interaction, like it doesn't even really see the proofs. Uh, so th this, this interaction, the zero knowledge middle box interaction doesn't require any server changes. So the server doesn't even really need to know that, that, that it's happening. Um, so when we, when we started this research project, we, we sort of sketched this architecture and we weren't even really sure that it was going to uh, work. So most prior efforts to make zero knowledge proofs efficient enough for, for real applications, like, like in cryptocurrency, for example, um, really rely on being able to tailor the computation that is proven in the zero knowledge proof to be sort of uh, like compatible in some sense with the, with the proof machinery. But because we want to work with standard protocols of TLS 1.3, really don't have this luxury. Uh, and these protocols are really, really complex and large, and they're not really designed to be efficient in a zero knowledge proof. So for example, just as a, a proof of the, the protocols being complex, here's the, just the key schedule part of the TLS 1.3 uh, protocol. It's this very, very complicated and very hairy uh, uh, diagram. Um, so this, this is a very daunting, it seems like a very daunting task to develop zero knowledge proofs that, are, that, that can be efficient enough for for real protocols and real applications. But when we, when we implemented our, our, our research and sort of did benchmarks, we, we found that the, the performance is really surprisingly good. And while the performance isn't really practical yet, we found that the, the performance is really, really much better than we thought. And we, we think that, that our, our, our research is really pretty close to practical already uh, today. Uh, so in the remainder of this talk, I will uh, describe first a little bit about the, the kind of cryptographic challenges that go into building a zero knowledge middle box protocol, in particular, this one cryptographic component called a channel opening protocol. Um, then I will uh, explain how we built zero knowledge middle boxes for some applications to encrypted DNS. And then finally, I'll talk about some future work um, that we're working on right now. So uh, to explain the cryptographic challenges, I first need to go into a little bit more detail about the kind of machinery of a zero knowledge proof. Um, so in a zero knowledge proof, this, this statement, uh, this public statement that's being proven is just sort of some sort of public arithmetic circuit. And if you don't know what an arithmetic circuit is, you can just imagine it like a regular circuit from, from hardware. It's, it's not that much different. Um, so the circuit uh, takes as input some public in inputs and additionally some private witnesses, which are the, the values that are that are kind of private to the proven are hidden by the zero knowledge guarantee. Um, so this, this uh, protocol um, works by having this prove algorithm that takes as input the circuit, the inputs, and the witnesses, and generates this, this proof string. And then the prover can send the inputs along with the proof to the verifier, which can run a verification algorithm that takes as input the circuit, the input, and the proof. And this, this algorithm outputs like true or false, zero or one. Um, and so the, just to restate this in, in this notation, the zero knowledge guarantee guarantees that the verifier can't learn anything about the witnesses from this, from this proof, uh, but it also prevents the prover from generating a proof uh, for which there are no witnesses or for which the this, this statement is false. So like no witnesses would make the statement true for, for, for a certain input. Um, so to build a circuit, like, a, like an, an arithmetic circuit for a zero knowledge middle box, uh, what we need to do at a high level is take as input the, 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 the client's encrypted traffic um, and also take as witness, the private witness, the key that it uses to decrypt that traffic. And what the circuit needs to do roughly is sort of decrypt this traffic and then extract the, the data which is relevant to the policy and then sort of verify its compliance uh, with, the, with the policy. So because these circuits are, are pretty large, um, they're complicated and they're also policy specific, we broke this down in the paper into three steps. Uh, so the, the channel opening handles the, like the cryptographic question of decrypting the traffic and then parse and extract extracts the information that's relevant for the policy. And finally, policy check actually checks the policy relevant data and outputs a zero or a one. So I just want to like briefly, yeah, um, yes, very briefly go into some detail about the channel opening uh, protocol. So for TLS 1.3, if you want to build a channel opening protocol, uh, the most obvious way of doing it is to just run the TLS 1.3 decryption algorithm in this zero knowledge proof. Um, there's, a, there's a really interesting and uh, challenging problem with this though, which is that the, the TLS 1.3 AEDs don't have a cryptographic property which prevents the client from crafting uh, ciphertexts that have multiple different decryptions. And so because they lack this property, which to be clear is not really required for standard operation of TLS 1.3, so this is no weakness in the protocol. Uh, it's just something that wasn't really a design requirement of TLS 1.3. But, but because this um, TLS 1.3 um, record layer lacks this property, a client could craft um, ciphertexts that have one decryption that's compliant and one decryption that's not compliant and sort of evade the policy. So we really need to prevent the client from exploiting this, this, this lack of binding. 
And so in the paper, we sketch a way of fixing this uh, by adding an additional constraint check to the circuit. And in a sense, what this constraint check does is requires the client to prove how it obtained the key, which is its witness, how it obtained this key from the cryptographic handshake that the client and the server performed to establish the key in the first place. So this is kind of a, a check of consistency between the handshake, which the middle box can see kind of going across on the wire, uh, and the key that is derived from that handshake. Um, and so by doing this, we sort of prevent the client from lying about the key. But then, of course, the question is, how do we craft this key consistency check uh, for TLS 1.3? And because we don't have time and because it would it would be very complicated to explain, I'm just going to give a very high level summary. Um, so there's a simple and inefficient way to do this, which is to just rederive all of the cryptographic values from the TLS 1.3 handshake in the uh, circuit. Um, but this is really slow in particular because you have to do public key cryptography in the circuit and public key cryptography. It's, it's description as a circuit is very large, which leads to a slow um, proof generation. So in the paper, we make an observation which is very useful, which is that the TLS handshake has a special property, which means that it sends a value during the handshake that actually acts as a commitment to some of the intermediate steps of the key derivation. And so by using this value as a kind of check, on the values in the circuit, we can short, shortcut most of the expensive operations involved in sort of checking the consistency of the key. And one, one thing that will be important later when I talk about um, evaluation is that this key consistency check, because TLS 1.3 session keys don't change generally during a TLS 1.3 session, if you have a long lived session, um, then the work of generating this key consistency check can be amortized across all messages you send uh, in this in the session. Um, so you can sort of do it once at the beginning, and without going into too much detail, the middle box can sort of remember a value um, that sort of commits you to the, the thing that you, um, the, the, the key that you proved consistency of, and then can, you can sort of refer back to this as you generate subsequent proofs. Um, so now that we're done with the more technical cryptographic portion of the talk, I just want to pop pop back up to the to the high level and, and take stock of where we are. Um, so I just told you a bit about how we at a cryptographic sort of protocol level build ZKMBs and, and how we define their protocols, but I haven't really told you about what kinds of applications ZKMBs are useful for. Um, so in the next portion of the talk, I'm gonna tell you about applications of the Zero Knowledge Middle Box Framework to, um, to problems in encrypted DNS uh, policy enforcement. Um, so I don't probably need to explain what encrypted DNS is to, to this audience, um, but just to, just to be clear and to establish some notation, uh, encrypted DNS is a way for clients to encrypt their DNS queries to resolvers that generally are not the one that their local network is, is run. Um, so the, generally the way this works is that the client and the DNS resolver establish HTTPS session and then they use the key uh, to encrypt their DNS queries and, and, the, and the results. Um, because the uh, DNS has a lot of privacy implications, uh, people are very excited about this, this way we can use encryption to sort of improve the privacy of DNS um, on, on the network. Um, and in, in particular, like um, uh, browsers like, like Firefox and Chrome and Edge, uh, to sort of protect the privacy of their users, uh, they're increasingly rolling out encrypted DNS as a sort of default mode for DNS resolution um, in, in, in various forms. Um, but, but by design, um, encrypted DNS causes a really, really challenging tension between, between policy enforcement in the network and, and privacy. Um, it, it prevents the network from enforcing um, all DNS-based policies, like in particular, like content filtering uh, or like, like malware scanning or, or, or anything like that. So when the network, if they, it has a block list of domains that it doesn't want the clients to be able to resolve in the network, the, the encryption prevents the network from seeing whether the clients are actually trying to resolve those, those domains. Um, so this, this caused and is causing a lot of opposition to encrypted DNS, uh, especially from administrators of networks where filtering is legally required. Uh, so for example, in the United States, there's a law called the Children's Internet Protection Law, which was passed in 2000 that requires operators of educational and library networks in particular to filter out uh, um, kind of obscene or, or objectionable traffic from the networks. Um, and the, the, a common way this is enforced is using DNS filtering. So when in, in 2019 and 2020, when Firefox wanted to actually turn on encrypted DNS by default for all its users, opposition of this kind forced Firefox to build a, a sort of network level mechanism to allow networks to disable DNS 
uh, if the networks believe that they need to that observe DNS um, uh, queries. So by, by sending the technical details here aren't so important. So, but by default, Firefox, if it uses encrypted DNS and it resolves a record um, to an NX domain, like use application DNS, it will prevent the user from using encrypted DNS and just send their, their queries unencrypted to the, to the local network resolver. Um, so to resolve these, these really challenging tensions, in the paper, we sketch a, a, an architecture for a, a zero knowledge middle box that can allow uh, networks to filter encrypted DNS without seeing DNS queries. Uh, so the way this uh, will work is that the, the network will first decide on their DNS block list and then it'll create a circuit that will sort of allow the, the client to sort of check and prove compliance with this block list uh, of, of their traffic. And then when the client joins the network, as I said, it'll receive the circuit and as well a description of the block list itself. And then the client and the, and the, and the destination resolver will establish a handshake just as before. Um, uh, and establish a key and then use it to encrypt their DNS queries. But when the client sends an encrypted DNS query, it will send in addition to its encrypted traffic, a proof that the underlying DNS query uh, of this connection, that it, the underlying DNS query that it wants to resolve is not uh, on the block list. So the way this works is not super germane for, for this talk and we're a little short on time anyway. So. Um, it, basically, the way it works is we, we just sort of parse, partially parse the DNS query in this circuit and extract a domain name and then use a standard technique to sort of prove that it is not in the set of, of block domains. And the way this works, there are a little bit of, there's a little bit of difference between DNS over TLS and DNS over HTTPS, uh, but the difference we'll see is, is, not, is not, not, so, not so relevant. Uh, so those, those protocol level details uh, don't make a humongous difference. And there's also a way to uh, maintain the privacy of the block list itself. So if, if the block list is proprietary uh, or the network doesn't want to share it, we sketch a protocol in our, our paper that allows hiding this block list. But we didn't implement this protocol and we believe that its concrete cost would be quite high. Um, so I, I think there's, there's more research needed here, but there is at least like, like it is feasible to do this on some level. Um, so I want to just quickly sketch one other application uh, from our paper and that is to uh, resolve or allow listing in oblivious DOH. So if you're not familiar, oblivious DOH is basically a way to proxy uh, a, a, a DNS over HTTPS. So the goal of this is to, to hide the, the identity of, a, of the client from the destination resolver to, to sort of solve the problem of uh, a one centralized resolver seeing everybody's DNS queries uh, and their identities. And so the way it works is that the clients will establish basically like in a sense, like two encrypted connections, one with a, a proxy that will forward its traffic and then one with the destination resolver. And then when it sends its DNS queries, it encrypts them sort of twice. It encrypts the query itself um, with the key for the destination resolver. And then it encrypts that ciphertext in the destination kind of again with HTTPS. And it sends it in an HTTPS connection to the ODH proxy. And then the, the proxy decrypts it and then forwards the encrypted query onto the destination resolver and then does the same thing for the, for the reply. Um, so the, the question that we wanted to resolve in, in our paper is, it seems like it's really hard in this architecture for networks to verify that their clients are using a filtered DNS resolver. So if the networks want to outsource the filtering, ODOH, because it hides the destination resolver from the network, uh, makes it really hard for the, for the, for the network to do that. So the way we solve, we propose solving this with the zero knowledge middle boxes. For example, if the, if the policy is that the network wants their clients to go to cleanbrowsing.org, we can do the same zero knowledge middle box setup and give the description of the circuit that checks whether the destination is cleanbrowsing.org to the to the client. And then after it uh, establishes its keys and sends its traffic, it additionally includes the zero knowledge proof that if the, that when it decrypts the, the, the when it decrypts the HTTPS request and compares the destination resolver to cleanbrowsing.org, this comparison uh, passes. So, so basically this, this proves that the underlying traffic is destined for a, for a filtered resolver without, without revealing it. Um, so I'll just briefly talk about some experimental results here. Um, we implemented all of our protocols using a, the Groth 16 zero knowledge proof uh, backend, which is a, a common one used in, in, in the Zcash cryptocurrency in particular. Um, and we uh, first implemented our, this key consistency proof that I told you about before. And we implemented a sort of naive baseline and we implemented our optimized protocol. Uh, and with the optimized protocol, uh, our performance was about 16 and a half seconds to generate a, a proof. So we can imagine this as every time the client opens a TLS session, 
uh, it additionally needs to do 16 and a half seconds of work to generate this one-time proof that that the that the, uh, the the key is consistent with uh, with the, with the handshake. And so uh, after this this initial setup, um, we can do we can do uh, generate proofs for the the uh, DNS filtering zero knowledge middle box that I told you about before for DOT in about three seconds. Um, so while this this three second number and sixteen and a half seconds are still a bit too high to use to use in practice. Um, there are a lot of ways to get these numbers uh, uh, down. Like for example, we can use new uh, newer zero knowledge proof systems that have better concrete performance. Um, so what I'll tell you about right now is a little bit of future work we're doing currently to reduce the the, the prover overhead of these schemes. Um, so we implement we re-implemented our protocols in a newer zero knowledge proof backend called Spartan. Um, and we, we saw a huge reduction in the, in the proving time for this key consistency check. So we saw about a 10x reduction in the amount of time it takes the client when it opens a new TLS session to generate this key consistency proof. Um, so one difference here and one sort of research challenge is that the proofs themselves that the client has to send to the middle box are quite a bit larger. So they're about 49 kilobytes with Spartan. Um, we, we don't think this is actually a huge problem because 49 kilobytes is still quite small um, as these things go, um, but it is the, the proofs are substantially larger than they were before. So this is something that we're thinking about um, how to fix. Um, and with Spartan, we, we re-implemented part of our, our protocol, uh, just to sort of decryption this channel opening step. Um, and we found that the, the cost again comes down hugely. Um, th this channel opening part of our, our decryption proof um, only takes about uh, two tenths of a second to generate a proof. And again, here that the proofs are, are, are larger, uh, but we have some ideas on, on how to get this down that we're working on, on right now. Um, so in conclusion, uh, in this work, my co-workers and I initiated a, a, a new line of work on zero knowledge middle boxes, uh, which use zero knowledge proofs to enable privacy preserving enforcement of network policies. Um, so one application that we gave in, in, is DNS filtering, which allows uh, a network to enforce a block listing policy without having to see DNS queries. And we also implemented a zero knowledge middle box for allow listing resolvers for oblivious DOH. And in the paper, we gave one further case study on uh, HTTPS firewalling. Um, we're really, really excited about this research and I hope now you are too. Um, we think zero knowledge middle boxes are really, really fascinating new abstraction for, for building network, network security and, and while enabling privacy. And, and they raise a lot of really, really fascinating questions in like, networking and systems and also in cryptography um, I, I'm, I'm secured. Um, so with that, I will conclude. And if you want to read the paper, I, I've given a URL here. And if you have any more questions about my work, um, my email is right here. So thanks so much for listening and for inviting me to speak here today. Um, and now I'll take any questions. And now we have our next talk, Shannon Weyrich talking about on the edge of small data. Good afternoon. Okay, I'm sorry. My, Shannon, my name is Shannon Wyrick, and uh, the title of my talk today is On the Edge of Small Data. So I'm going to talk about an open source observability tool that I've been working on. Uh, but first, I'm going to talk a bit about this concept of uh, small data that I've been developing and, and see if it resonates with you folks. So I'm going to do that through the lens of the company that I work for. So I work for NS1. Uh, we're a managed authoritative DNS provider. We run a Anycast network uh, to deliver our, our DNS, as, as many of you do. And we're doing something on the order of 100 billion DNS queries per average day, and that's something like, call it 30 terabytes of, of raw DNS traffic that's traversing our edge network uh, every day. And so within this raw data, there's information that we care about, right? There's information that we want to extract that's going to help us operate our network, debug it, protect it, scale it. And so the question arises, how do we extract that information? How do we extract those insights? How do we extract that signal from that stream of data that's going on? And we thought about this in different ways over time. And, and I think when you're, you're approached with this question of how do we extract this, you, you have to build some kind of system to do it. And initially, as, as we did, uh, you often think, well, what I want to do is capture as much telemetry as possible, as much data as possible. Let me try to collect it and put it into some kind of data warehousing system so that I can ask 
any question that I want of it. And that's very reasonable, and there's a lot of good use cases for that. Um, but what we found over time is what we want is actually the insights that we extract from that data, right? It's not the raw data that, that we necessarily need. It's the insights that are going to help us operate and debug and scale our networks. And we found that there's, there are prices to pay for, call it these, the big data solutions. So some of the things that we've seen in terms of downsides include uh, pipelines, right? You have to set up some kind of system to extract things um, that might be pipelines that are sort of complicated or fragile, and especially in the face of uh, increased traffic or attacks and so forth. And then you have to get the data somewhere and then process it, right? Because again, the raw data is not particularly valuable. Um, if you're collecting, for example, packet captures, you need to process it and, and, and extract the insights from it somehow to make it actionable. And if it's a lot of data, um, sometimes it can be tough to make sense of it or, uh, or to take advantage of it, right? If you build a big system and you have a lot of data, you want to feel that you're getting the value out of it. Another thing we've seen is um, it can lead to short retention times, right? You may, um, just due to the volume of the data, only be able to keep uh, a certain amount of it before you have to, to rotate it. It can lead to slow dashboards. Uh, and also things like um, slow reaction times, right? If you, if you use this data to protect your network, uh, and it takes time to go through that pipeline, then you're potentially um, losing time when you need to understand what's happening on your edge network uh, very quickly. And of course, it could just be costly to, to ship data around to. So I want to uh, talk about this idea of, of shifting something, and I call it this, this small data approach. But really, it's just to push the conversion of raw data to actual data out to the edge, where the events are taking place. And if we think about uh, that strategical shift or architectural shift, um, there are several benefits. So one is that we can react quicker because we do have the insights now available, much closer to where the events are happening. And so we can take advantage of that locally. But we can also collect those insights into a central database still and have uh, a global view of our, of our edge networks. And because we're extracting those insights at the edge, we're just dealing with less data now because we're dealing with, uh, call it the signal, uh, as opposed to the noise. And so we've, we've collected, uh, the, the data that we're collecting and processing and storing is just smaller in volume. And so one analogy is that instead of collecting the haystack and, and searching for the needle later, what we're trying to do with this system is just collect the needles. But to make that work, uh, we also need the ability to decide what the signal is at any time, right? It's not going to be a static thing. And so we need a dynamic system for deciding what this signal is, how to analyze it, how to extract it. We need to change our minds about that and change it in real time across our network in real time. So, uh, so yes, Shannon Weirich, um, I've been in the industry for quite some time. I've been at NS1 for about eight years. And for the last year and a half, I've been working on uh, this open source project called Orb. So let's dive into what that is. So I'm going to put right up front a, a sort of quick summary. If uh, there's one takeaway about the project, uh, please let it be this. So Orb is an observability tool that's been just designed for distributed edge networks. It uses this small data paradigm that I've talked about, and it combines it with this idea of dynamic policy orchestration. And the goal is to collect insights across the data that's flowing through a distributed edge. It's been designed to work with modern observability stacks, and it is free and open source, backed by NS1. So here's a Grafana dashboard of some of the data that uh, Orb can collect. And this probably looks familiar to you. You probably have systems that, that show this type of information. And so the difference is going to be that this data was analyzed at the edge, and we collected all these insights in real time. And it does this with deep streaming analysis, again, directly on the edge. Uh, there are multiple handlers that can uh, deeply inspect the data. It's doing this across um, several different types of, of inputs that we'll go through a bit. But currently, it's focused around uh, extracting metrics for network L2, L3, DNS, and also flow. And the idea is that we want to collect more interesting metrics here. So uh, in particular, we're able to do things like top K heavy headers, so we can get top IPs and geo and Q names and so forth, uh, again, directly at the edge. We can do cardinality. We can do percentiles and rates 
and, and timings and, and all, sorts, all sorts of um, useful information, again, that, that we need to, uh, to run our networks. Okay, so ORB really has two parts to it. There's the control plane side of things, and then there's the edge analyzer. So I'll go through both. This is the control uh, tower for the edge, we call it. So this is the, um, this is the part of ORB that uh, offers several different services for um, controlling the edge observability. So uh, of course it includes a REST API, so it's all API driven. It's meant to be, it's meant to be automated against. We do include a user interface, so there's a, there's a portal. And then there's the different services that make it work, right? So the first part is fleet management. And this is because since it's an edge service, we have a lot of different orb agents that are uh, distributed across the network that are doing the analyzing. And so you need a way to, um, to manage them, right? You need a, them to connect into the control plane. We need to organize them and tag them and so forth. So that's the fleet management system. And then the dynamic piece, um, being able to tell it in real time what we'd like to analyze. That's the policy system. And so we can think of these as recipes for what to analyze and which agents should be analyzing as well. So part of it is that we don't have just a, a simple way to send to everywhere. We can split them up into groups and, and, um, and decide exactly which agents are analyzing uh, which data. And also built into the system is a way to collect the results of it and get it into a time series database or some other kind of database so that you can have your central view as well. So um, we call that data collection and syncing. Here's a architecture overview that shows how the system works. And so the control plane piece that I was just going through is the sort of big cloud in the middle. <clears throat> so this is a microservice architecture uh, setup. Each of the services that I mentioned in the last slide are, are contained within there. Um, it runs on Kubernetes. This is something that you can self-host. You can deploy and run yourself. Um, we do also offer a SaaS version of this at orb.live, which you can check out anytime. And so that's the control plane piece that has the API. That's how you could automate against it. That's where the portal lives. And then along the top row, we see the edge analyzers. Right? And the idea is that these get deployed into hybrid typology. It might be cloud. It might be your own infrastructure. Um, it might be paired with DNS servers that you have. And we're able to analyze different types of input streams and collect the metrics according to the policies that have been sent to it uh, back into the system and then sync them out into databases. Right? And so a key point of this right now is that Orb does not um, include a database. You do plug this into your existing uh, tools for, uh, for observability for time series databases. In particular, right now, we're focused on Prometheus compatible. Um, that's what's built in right now, but we're switching our uh, telemetry system to use open telemetry, uh, which is a, a standard that will support many different types of uh, syncs. And then you visualize an action on the data using, again, your, your observability stack. So I'm not going to go through all these, but just to give a quick um, sense of what the portal looks like. Uh, and again, if you go to orb.live, you can log in and see all this. It's a very quick sign up process, no credit card or anything like that. It's just, just this open source um, system running here. Part of it is the fleet management. This is where you organize the agents that you've connected into your system. We do have a way to tag them and organize them. You're able to understand which of your agents are online, whether they're heart beating and what, what they're running and so forth. So that's all built in. Then we have the policy management side of it. So this is the list of, uh, again, the types of uh, column recipes for what we're interested in observing. You can organize those. You connect in where you want to send the data. So this, um, this is the sort of pipelining aspect of it. And it uh, is able to form fairly complex pipelines. So you can decide per policy exactly where you'd like to send. You can send to different databases. You can send to multiple, multiple databases. And the last piece is a sort of configuration management aspect, right? Again, we have a system for uh, deciding which policies go out to which groups of agents. There's an agent grouping system. It does use a simple tagging system so we can, uh, for example, tab, uh, tag by uh, pop location, right? So geographic location. I can send policies to, um, to certain pops, for example. And then finally, as we said, get them into the sinks for dashboarding and alerting. 
Okay, so moving to the edge side of things. So what does the edge agent look like? How does it do its streaming analysis? So this is where you would um, install this agent either directly on nodes that are serving or nearby and, and stream data to it. So its job is to tap into these data streams and it's able to do that concurrently for several different data streams according to the policies that have been sent to it. It uses fast streaming algorithms to do its analysis. It uses data sketch algorithms uh, to, to collect the metrics that I mentioned before. And its job is to efficiently summarize and gather these insights, right, extract the signal, so to speak, and generate these metrics. And so it's the thing that gets programmed in real time. If you bring up an agent um, from scratch, it's not doing anything because you haven't sent it a policy yet. So that's what the ORB control plane does. You decide uh, and, and tell it what to do in real time. Um, the agent has been built to be as efficient as possible. It's able to both scale up and scale down. Um, we've scaled it down as far as running on a Raspberry Pi, for example, and it's able to scale up by uh, taking advantage of multiple cores as well as um, just sort of scaling horizontally with multiple processes as well uh, because we can control the fleet from the control plane. So what types of things are we tapping into? So uh, it's inside of NS1, we've mostly used packet capture to date. You're able to program it with VPF filters. So this is sort of a, you know, a TCP dump style. Um, it also uh, now works with DNS tap, so um, both via socket or streaming to it via TCP, and it uses the same analyzer uh, engine, regardless of whether it's packet capture or DNS tap. We've also started processing flow data as well, and uh, there's a series of metrics that can come directly from flow data. And this is an expandable system, so uh, it's, it's a modular system that we have uh, plans to support many different types of inputs in the future as well. So the types of analysis that it's doing, uh, as we saw a little earlier, it's focused on L2 and L3 network metrics, um, DNS. We do have a DCP analyzer, and we have the flow analyzer as well. Uh, it's able to do deep packet inspection, essentially, so it could support um, any protocol that it's able to dissect and analyze. And the list of metrics is, is always growing, right? This is a key area that um, we're expecting that contributors could come in and say, you know, they're interested in, uh, in extracting different metrics and we can get that um, into the modules themselves. And the policies themselves are also very granular. So um, you do not have to turn on every uh, analyzer for um, every policy. You can pick and choose uh, exactly which types of metrics you'd like to extract when you create your policies. And again, this is a modular system and so um, the list of analyzers and so forth will, will grow in the future. So just to give an idea of the view from the orb agent and how it's processing the streams in real time, uh, this is based on a tool called Pack Advisor, which is a, uh, I gave a talk on an ORC um, 33, I think, and so I went into detail there. Uh, I won't go into too much detail here, but the idea is that um, based on the policies that have come in, in this example, there are three different policies running. Uh, it's focused on two different taps. One is a packet capture tap with some filters on it. One is a flow tap, um, again, with some filters on it. And so each of those data streams is filtered at the tap level. And then you have the analyzers, based on the policies, have been told to create metrics for different dimensions of data, right? The first policy is looking at uh, only DNS traffic that has uh, an R code of NX domain. The second one is focused on a particular queue name. Uh, and the third one is, is looking at flow data. And so all of these are running concurrently in the Pack Advisor, in the ORB agent. And they're each generating their own time series metrics. And then we're collecting that back out through the ORB agent, back through the ORB control plane, and syncing it into the time series databases that you've told it to go to. And again, it's really important that these policies can come and go at any time, right? This is a, this is a real time system. Uh, a further note is that um, currently it is focused around uh, operators essentially creating policies and sending them out. But the goal is that uh, we start adding more automation. We want the ability for the system itself to decide um, when, for example, an anomaly has occurred and it sh itself should fire up a new policy and start recording interesting metrics for us. So real quickly, this is another view of it. So if, uh, you know, particular DNS use case analysis, we have raw DNS traffic streaming into this, this orb agent, this packet visor agent, um, and, you know, it's coming in in sort of waves. 
and it's important to note that the output of this is always a study summary, right? So um, even if you know you have a small amount of traffic, it's generating uh, the the summary of, of interesting information that you told it to, top queries, and so forth, uh, and by default in one minute buckets. Um, but even in the case of uh, a monster amount of traffic, it's not generating any more data. It's generating the same amount of data because it's still summarizing uh, the, the information that it's seeing. And, um, and if, it, if it does do too much work, it tries to degrade gracefully and, and still keep on working. Okay, so project status. So the, the core technology, the Packet Advisor technology, has actually been in use inside of NS1 operationally for many years. Um, so it's, it's well considered production. Um, the ORB technology, the ORB control plane is a bit newer, uh, but we're already starting to power DNS products uh, inside of NS1 with it. Um, it is open source, all of our work is done on, on GitHub, um, so you're able to track that and use our issue tracker and so forth. Uh, and we're looking for those in the industry to, um, who have interesting use cases where this technology and this strategy uh, is interesting and we're starting to partner with them and, uh, and help develop out the product. And if that fits one of your use cases, certainly we'd like to talk with you. Um, there's a lot we're looking at doing. Of course, we're, we're looking to get it out into the community and get feedback. Um, we've got a whole list of input analyzers and, and streams we'd like to do. Machine learning uh, is a big part of it. We definitely want things to be uh, automated in the future. Um, policies at the, uh, sorry, actions at the edge is also important to us, using that local information at the node so that we can uh, we can action on it immediately in real time is really interesting. And of course, there's, there's probably other ideas as well. Okay, so just to wind up. Again, uh, th this is an observability tool. It's been designed for distributed edge networks. It's using this small data paradigm, combining it with dynamic policy orchestration collecting insights from the data flow on our distributed edges and integrating it with modern observability stacks. And it's all free and open source. I've got some links here. We do have a community website where there's uh, more information and some link to, uh, for example, our Slack and, and some other things. Um, we do have the SaaS version that's out there. Again, this is really just uh, the hosted version of what you can do um, self-hosted, uh, but just makes it easier to, to try out and, and, and POC, and certainly would love your feedback if you do try that. Uh, please start our project on GitHub if, uh, if this is interesting to you, and again, contact us if, uh, if the project looks interesting. That's about all I have, so uh, thank you very much, and uh, if I'll take some questions. Okay. Okay, so the question was, what's the maximum number of QPS we push through one node uh, of the orb agent? So the, the orb agent, uh, I've tried to set a standard of processing to, to some degree of depth, uh, about 100,000 packets per second per CPU. And now it can do, uh, it can use multiple CPUs. And so theoretically, it could do that times the number of cores you have on the system. Um, yeah, that's the standard I'm trying to go for. Okay, Peter Spacek wants to know, what takes priority if a node is overloaded? Traffic or monitoring? What takes priority if it's overloaded traffic or monitoring? So uh, it's been designed to have a, a zero blast radius, right? So it should never affect the serving of traffic, if that's what the question means. So um, it's meant to passively tap into the data sources. Uh, so yeah, it should never affect actual serving of traffic. Of course, if you if you do put it on a machine that's competing with resources, with uh, the you know, something that's serving the data, you do have to be careful about that. Or will not um, will not help you with that. The way we've done it is to limit it to certain CPUs, while we limit serving to other CPUs if we do run it on the same node. Thanks again to our sponsors, connectivity and networking. Um, from Comcast and VeriSign as our 2022 workshop sponsors.
and I guess that's it. This will be the last break, and then we'll come back for the last session of the day. All right, thank you, everybody. Well, welcome back, everybody, from the final break of the day for the final session of the day. And thanks once more to Comcast as the workshop sponsor and the connectivity sponsor, and to VeriSign as the 2022 workshops patron. Um, we have two speakers for the price of one today. We have Shimon Huck and Victor Dukovny talking about Dane for the latest installment of the DNS Talk series. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Shuman Huck. Um, and as Suzanne mentioned, I was invited by the program committee to do, give a talk on Dane as part of the new DNS Talk series. And as you figured out, I uh, also recruited my uh, collaborator, Victor Duchovny, to join me to help me do this talk and specifically to speak about the Dane survey project he's been running for a number of years. Um, okay, so what are we actually talking about? DANE is an acronym for DNS-based authentication of named entities. And what it basically means is employing DNSSEC, that is, signed DNS records to securely associate cryptographic keys or certificates with domain names for applications. Applications can then use the DNS to securely obtain and verify those keys and use them in application security protocols. All right, so what do we hope to achieve with this new system? Well, the main goal is to securely associate domain names with cryptographic credentials, but using a system that naturally supports uh, namespace constra constraints, so that only domain owners can issue these associations for names that they control and nobody else. So this can provide, at least in theory, a complete replacement for today's public CA system. That's a system of certification authorities. Or it could be used in a mode where it applies constraints on the use of the public CA system. And I'll explain how it does that a little bit later. There are additional benefits. We can enable applications to use uh, features and certificates that are not well supported or not supported at all by the public CA system. And lastly, we can enable the secure use of authenticated raw public keys. That is, public keys without needing the um, certificate machinery around them. Um, so by way of motivating the need for Dane, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about the current internet PKI, that's the public key infrastructure, and its limitations. So the situation we have uh, today is that a very large number of application services authenticate server names with X509 certificates, most commonly using the underlying TLS layer. And just to throw out a few examples, we have HTTP, IMAP, SMTP, SIP, XMTP, there are many others. And these certificates are issued and signed by the Internet PKI, which is composed of a set of globally trusted uh, public certification authorities. Um, so the first and most glaring weakness is that we need to trust a very large number of CAs and they are effectively unconstrained in scope. That means any of them can issue certificates for any entity on the internet. Um, it doesn't matter if you have an explicit business relationship with them or not. So our collective security basically is uh, equivalent to the weakest one of them. So I don't think I need to tell this audience, but that's an absolutely terrible characteristic for any security system to have, right? So usually want the complete opposite, you want a system that operates with the principle of least privilege. Um, if you look at the uh, root certificate store on your uh, operating system or a web browser, you'll probably see about 200 to 300 CAs. But the problem is it, a lot larger than that. A lot of these root CAs additionally sign sub-CAs under them, uh, typically for enterprise CAs. Um, Again, typically with no name, namespace constraints. So there's an excellent paper. It's a little bit da dated from 2013. 
the analysis of the HTTPS certificate ecosystem, which goes into surveys the landscape, and you can see, um, uh, you know, the extent of the problem and uh, just the sheer size of the attack surface involved. Um, so the next issue, also very important, is revocation, and that's the process for invalidating certificates or keys that uh, may have been compromised. And this worked very poorly in the Internet PKI today. Certificates generally have uh, quite lengthy validity periods. Certificate revocation lists, or CRLs, these are lists of um, certificates that have been compromised that the CA has published. They're kind of ungainly and difficult to deal with in real time. There is a real-time mechanism to look up the status of certificates. This is called OCSP. But that has a significant privacy leakage problem. So the CA that operates an OCSP uh, responder effectively is in a position to uh, monitor and track every site that you visit. So that's no good. There is a mechanism to deal with this. This is called stapled OCSP, where the statuses are stapled into the TLS handshake. This is not widely de deployed, but it also requires surrounding machinery to mandate the use of the stapling, and that's very difficult to deploy uh, incrementally, and furthermore, it doesn't um, address use cases that don't involve uh, the TLS protocol. Um, again, there are functional def deficiencies that have security implications, too. So most CAs today are only capable of issuing certificates with the very basic capability. So if you need to use, use advanced features like alternative name forms or certificate extensions, you're basically out of luck. And we really need to be using these features because if you think about it, ideally we need to be able to com uh, compartmentalize the security of distinct application protocols that may be located at the same domain name. Uh, technically, it is possible to do that if certificates use what are called application-specific identities, like URI or SRV name. There are a few others. But uh, today, no public CA is able to support any of those features. Um, all right. So, of course, there's a fundamental reliance on the DNS as well. Uh, ultimately, the Internet PKI relies on domain names. After all, application services are identified by domain names today, and those need to be thoroughly secured and trusted. And really, the best way we have to do that is by using mechanisms like DNSSEC and Dane. Um, so these vulnerabilities that I've outlined, these are, of course, not theoretical. There's a long storied history of security compromises that you may know about. Uh, many of, some of them are due to malicious actors, but Many of them are also due to sheer incompetence or negligence on the part of the CA. So I'm not going to go through the entire list I'm, I'm going to show you here, but I have several pages where I've uh, uh, put links to uh, CA compromises that have been visibly in the news. So we have uh, Komodo, DigiNotar, TrustWave, Turk Trust, Telia Sonera. Uh, Francis AN, SSI, Komodo, CNNIC, Semantic, Rosign, Semantic again, uh, Digicert, and the list goes on. So um, if you're not familiar, you can read it up uh, in your, uh, at your leisure. But I'm going to move on. So if you talk to PKI folks, they will point out uh, sometimes that the PKIC system does support name constraints. And that is, in fact, true. The problem is they are very seldom used. And even in cases where they are used, there are issues, namely because they're type specific. The, the way that they are deployed today is uh, they aren't marked. The extension is marked not critical, which means that you cannot enforce their use. And that's critical for, for security. But uh, it, it doesn't really matter. I mean, even if the system technically supports name constraints, it is not generally amenable to the business model of the public CA system, where every public CA wants to be able to issue certificates for a global population of potentially paying customers, right? So it'll never work. But even if we wanted to design, redesign the system to do that, what we would have to do is to, to, to deploy a hierarchical PKI. And that, 
at that point, it's better to use DNSSEC because it's already, it already has that feature. So um, there are things that have been developed, like certificate transparency, which, um, and deployed, actually. And what they do is they offer a cryptographically verifiable and unalterable log of every certificate that has been issued by the public CAs. So, uh, but essentially, this is kind of a Band-Aid because uh, what they can be used is to retroactively detect uh, misissuance or fraudulently issued certificates, but what we really need is a system that proactively prevents the misissuance of certificates in the first place. Um, and then we have another problem because with the introduction of this system, we have, in addition to the public CAs themselves, we have yet another set of trusted uh, parties that we have to trust, right? So that, again, I don't know if that makes the situation any better because we have more points of attacks and an increasingly larger surface area for those attacks. So what about CAA records? These actually can help on the margins a little bit. So what the DNS CAA record does, if you're familiar with it, is uh, allow a domain owner to publish which CAs are authorized to issue certificates for names in their domain. So what this can do is it can prevent accidental misissuance of certificates by well-behaved CAs that carefully check these records but it does absolutely nothing to prevent attacks by malicious CAs. And also, it's a issuer side check only. What we really need is an application verifier side check, which is exactly what Dane provides. So what, how can the DNS folks help? Well, Dane can help by placing certificates and public keys or references to them in the DNS where they can be authenticated with DNSSEC signatures. And uh, DNS, um, and by implication DNSSEC, has a hierarchical and decentralized administration with a single root, not like 400 roots, which is very strongly defended and well secured. And crucially, the DNS system has names, namespace constraints that are built in, right? So a domain owner can only make modifications to records in their own zone. They can't do it to any other organization's zone. Right? That's what I mean by namespace constraints. The DNS-based um, uh, systems, like Dane, have much more timely revocation mechanisms, which you can achieve by uh, shrinking the TTL and removing records. That's all you have to do. That's the equivalent of certificate revocation in the Dane world. And it's also better suited to a class of applications that use certain types of DNS redirection mechanisms like MX and SRV and, and down the road newer types of records like SVCP. So is uh, Dane practical though? I would say that uh, uh, gradually it is becoming so. Deployed infrastructure is becoming real. The, the root of the DNS and most of the TLDs are signed today. So I think that's all of the GTLDs and almost all of the CCTLDs. So organizations under them can sign their zones and have an intact authentication chain from the root zones trust actor. Validation is also widespread and growing. However, DNSSEC deployment under the TLDs is still relatively sparse. So I think Victor can tell you more about the measurements, but I think uh, if you look at the um, zones under the effective TLDs, right? So TLDs are effective TLDs. The penetration is about 5%. Um, and application protocols, of course, will need changes to work with Dane, and that's a process that's been going on for a while. Some applications support it. Other applications will definitely need work. All right. So um, this is just for reference. These are the main IETF protocol specifications that define how Dane works. And let's talk about the first one, which is RFC 6698. This defined a new DNS record called the TLSA record that allows you to put uh, certificates or public keys or hashes of them into a DNS record signed by DNSSEC 
and also uh, specifies how you use them, right? So there are modes of Dane where you can use it in conjunction with the public CA system, and there are modes in which you can use them entirely without, so everything is authenticated in, in the DNS system entirely. The other uh, document you should probably read is RFC 7671, which updates the original specica specification with additional operational guidance. Um, so I'm gonna, instead of going through all the details, I'm gonna do it with an example, but I just wanna talk about the first parameter first, which is the usage field. So um, there are two types of usage that allow Dane to coexist and strengthen the public CA system. And there are two modes, the second two, that allow Dane to operate entirely in DNSSEC. So the first two, PKIX-TA and PKIX-EE, are what are called the PKIX constraining modes. And they use Dane to apply constraints on the use of the public CAs. So the first one, you can use a Dane TLSA record to specify that only a specific public CA should be trusted for the service certificate for that domain. And the second one, you can nail down uh, even more granularly, only a specific service certificate that is authenticated with, uh, through the public CA system, but only that one can be trusted. So that's called PKIX EE. The last two, uh, the first one, usage mode two, is Dane TA, that's where you can specify a CA that you run, or like a, a local enterprise CA, that is completely independent of the public CA system, and you can nail it down in the DNS uh, and specify its certificate or public key and say that is trusted to issue certificates for uh, your application domain names. And the Dane EE mode specifies not the trust anchor or the root CA, but the actual LEAF certificate, the certificate for the application service itself. All right. So um, I'll uh, highlight the details of the TLSA record by means of an example. So here's an example of a TLSA record for the mail service at example.com. So it has a bunch of components. If you look on the, at the owner name of the DNS record, so that's the thing on the left-hand side, it's composed of a number of piece, pieces. So it has two prefix labels in the beginning. The first one identifies the port number, that's port 25, and the second one uh, identifies the transport protocol in use, in this case TCP, and the remaining labels identify the domain name of the application endpoint, in this case it's mail.example.com. Uh, so if you look at the uh, resource data, or the R data of the record, you'll see it starts with uh, three parameters. These are one octet parameters each. Uh, the first one is the usage parameter, so those are the things that I just mentioned, the PKIX modes and the Dane mode, so which mode you operate uh, Dane in. The next one is called the selector, which identifies what you're putting in the DNS record, where it's, wh whether or not it's the entire X509 certificate or the public key embedded in the certificate, but it could be a raw public key too, which doesn't have a certificate. And the third parameter is what's called a matching type. So this says uh, the uh, data in the TLS record, uh, what kind of data is it? Is it the full selector? So is it the full certificate or is it the entire public key? That's the raw binary data for those, uh, for a certificate it would be in dir form, for example. Or whether it's a cryptographic hash of it. And the two hashes that are supported today are SHA-256, that's matching type one, and SHA-512, which is matching type two. So in this example, we're using a SHA-256 hash. And lastly, the blob of data right at the end is the certificate association data. And uh, in this case, it's hex encoded. In this case, since we're using, if we go back, we see we're using selector one, so this is a uh, public key and SHA-256, so this is a SHA-256 encoding of the public key of the certificate for that service. 
And it's hex encoded, so that's, uh, what is it? It's like 64 characters, right? So it's 256 bytes, bits, and that feeds 64 characters repre represented. So if we put all of this uh, together, what we can say is that this Dane record specifies the SHA-256 hash of the public key of the certificate that should match the server certificate for the mail service running at mail.example.com. Authenticated entirely in the DNS because it's using PK, it's using usage mode three, Dane E, right? So it has no reliance on the public CA system. Um, okay, so I wanted to show this uh, kind of amusing uh, cartoon, at least amusing to me. Um, this is probably eight years old now, and this was a way in early presentations to get PKIX folks to warm up the idea of Dane invading their territory. So what it says is that the Dane record for NLNet Labs is identifying out of the range of you know, 200, 300 PKIs, which CA and which CA alone is authorized to issue certificates for my services, right? So it's pointing to you know, that CA in the brown shirt with the funny hair, only that CA, no other CA is allowed to issue certificates for me. Um, okay, so what applications can use Dane? Potentially many of them, any, anything that uses the TLS protocol could use it. In practice today, it's only used by uh, a few, predominantly uh, SMTP and to a smaller extent Jabber, which is the XMPP protocol. Uh, Victor told me recently there's some browser blockchain folks uh, interested in maybe using it already, but uh, we'll fill in details later when we get to that. Um, so let's talk about Dane for SMTP transport security. This is one area where there has been, uh, I would say, significant uh, uptake of Dane. This is defined in RFC 7672. And what it uh, specifies is a way to use Dane to authenticate the server side of connections between SMTP servers, specifically MTAs or message transfer agents. So without Dane, the situation today is that most connections between SMTP servers use encryption opportunistically. And even when it does use it, it is vulnerable to attack. So attackers could strip away the TLS capability advertisement from the SMTP protocol negotiation and then downgrade the connection effectively to plain text. And uh, uh, TLS connections are also often unauthenticated. So what Dane does is addresses the security gap by authenticating the SMTP server's certificate using a signed TLSA record. And additionally, to prevent downgrade to plain text, it uses the presence of the TLSA record as an indicator that TLS must be used. Uh, there's already a range of software that supports Dane SMTP today, Postfix, Exim and a bunch of others listed here. Um, here's an example. So what we see here is the MX record for example.com points to mail.example.com. So what we do is we provision the TLSA record at the application endpoint name, mail.example.com. It uses uh, port 25 TCP, so it has the prefix labels uh, uh, prepended to it. And in this case, we're using parameters 311, right, which is uh, Dane uh, public key, and uh, SHA-256. So both of these things must be signed. And I believe for Dane SMTP, only the Dane usage modes are recommended. The PKIX modes are not recommended, but I can't specifically remember why. So maybe, I don't know if you want to chime in on, on that or later. OK, we'll keep going. <laughs> Um, so there is uh, a big email provider that has recently announced that they support, uh, are supporting Dane, that's Microsoft, and you can read about it here. Um, it wasn't clear for me from reading this announcement whether it's just Dane uh, outbound or inbound too, so if you read the note, it says that they were going to do both directions by late 2021, but it's kind of old information, so if anyone knows actually what they're doing that would be interested to know. But here's a big provider that it's doing it on their production service. 
Okay, so the next application is uh, kind of there's a generic specification for supporting Dane authentication for any application service that uses SRV records, and that's described in RFC, is it 7672, I think, right? 73, right. Um, and so the basic idea is uh, very similar to, um, uh, to SMTP. You place the TLSA record at the application endpoint name prefix with the port number and the transport protocol used by that application. And the resource data on the right side is, is kind of the same. You have the, kind of the same options. Um, okay, so what about Dane TLS for the web? So a lot of people wanted this to happen. Some people think that this could have been the killer app for, uh, for Dane. And the CA security incidents that I outlined previously almost all related to the web PKI. So, so Dane would have been an excellent solution to the problems in that landscape. But it has always been a challenging proposition to tackle uh, this task because it involves uh, introducing a competitor to a uh, highly dominant authentication system which has many powerful entrenched interests, right? Nevertheless, there were a lot of people uh, who were interested in trying to make that happen. And there were early attempts, even by Google, to authenticate X509 certificates in, in the DNS. So uh, I should say that this was a pre-Dane effort, but essentially the idea was the same to try to authenticate keys and certificates in the DNS. Ultimately, that didn't go anywhere, and they, they withdrew that experiment. But there was a second, more complete uh, attempt to standardize this in the IETF that I was involved in, uh, Victor was involved in, a bunch of people were, um, called the TLS DNS chain extension. And it was a more dynamic way to deliver the complete chain of DNSSEC records that you would need to authenticate a TLSA record inside a TLS handshake. Um, so the question you might ask is, why would you need this kind of mechanism? Why don't web browsers just query uh, Dane records like everyone else? And the answer is that web browser folks have very specific needs where the normal way of doing Dane queries just wouldn't work. So browsers are, uh, often need to deal with middle boxes that impede their ability to look up Dane and DNS records. This is actually a real problem. And the second one, which is kind of disputed, is they, want, uh, they don't want any additional latency, right? So DNSSEC involves many more queries. And having the TLS server build up the complete authentication chain and deliver it in one shot to the client uh, through the TLS handshake takes care of eliminating this additional latency. And then uh, there's, an, there's another reason. If you have it delivered in the TLS chain, the end station just has to verify the signatures. It doesn't need to run a full validating stub resolver, which is not very common, or it doesn't need a secure connection to an external full validating resolver, which is also not very commonly done. So, uh, what's the status of that work? So ultimately, this effort failed uh, in the ITF because of heated technical disagreements, which I won't go into here, but if you want to know details, feel free to come up and chat with me and uh, Victor. But the spec has been published. It wasn't published as a standard stack RFC. It was published on the informational track. And even though the web will not be using Dane in the immediate future as a result, uh, other applications are indeed looking at it. So there are things like... Um, uh, Dane TLS for encrypted uh, DNS, that's where it could play a role. Uh, for client to resolver, I think uh, Dane probably won't happen because DNS over HTTPS is probably going to be the dominant way to protect those queries. But for recursive to authoritative uh, DNS, Dane TLS could have a role, including the chain extension. All right, so here's a, a second type of uh, Dane record called Open PGP Key. So, all right, so this is a way to securely publish open PGP public keys in the DNS. And the way we do that is I'll give you an example using my open PGP key record. So what we do is we take the identifier in the PGP key, which is an email address typically, 
we uh, transform the local part by creating a, a truncated hash uh, and put it in the first label. The second label is the fixed ring open PGP key, and the rest is the domain name, right? So we have an example there. And these uh, things can get very large. Uh, if you see the example where I look up uh, my key, it's about uh, 2,000K. So TCP should be used me. to fetch them. Schumann? Yes. We are a little bit behind time. Oh, okay. All right. So I'll speed up. You. So smime is a, another method to uh, put uh, smime keys or certificates in the DNS. And here's another example. Uh, and let me go through it a little bit fast. How, how much time do I have? Five. All right. Um, and in that case, let me go straight to, let me skip over this step and let me allow Victor to talk about the Dane survey. Uh, hi. Uh, so I've been operating a Dane survey since October 2017. Uh, it's, uh, yes, uh, its goal is to make sure that the early Dane adopters uh, don't, through negligence and having insufficient pressure on them keeping their data correct, kind of sort of spoil the ecosystem so that people who come along and want to deploy Dane find that it's mostly all bad records and broken. Uh, and so consequently, uh, because the uh, adoption growth was very slow uh, and anticipated to be slow, there needed to be some artificial uh, means to let people know that their data is wrong uh, so that it would be corrected and would facilitate further adoption. Uh, and so th the goal is really to notify people who mess up, but as a side effect of the survey, uh, it also publishes uh, ongoing data on adoption that may in fact encourage others to uh, uh, join in. Uh, so the data collected is all kinds of interesting DNS data, about as many signed domains as I can get my hands on. Uh, currently about 19.1 million, uh, but also reaches out to the SMTP servers of the various signed domains and make sure that their TLSA records are correct, or if not, uh, reach out to them and notify them. Uh, this graph it shows you uh, DNSSEC growth over time. Uh, you can see that sometime in uh, spring of 2020, the adoption rate picked up. Uh, a few signers decided to sign domains more aggressively, and it's been somewhat linear ever since. Uh, and hopefully uh, more domains will be signed and the slope will pick up. But over the last you know, year or two, we've had fairly steady growth, soon to reach 20 million before the end of this year. Uh, the survey, as you see, collects interesting metrics on DNSSEC. We see that algorithm eight is by far the most popular. A 13 ECDSA is the next one. It's pretty close. And then we see at the bottom, you know, algorithm seven and five, which are deprecated, are still hanging in there. They've both fallen by 90%, actually more than 90% from their peak deployment, but now they've reached a long tail and those numbers are barely budging. Anybody still using algorithm five and seven, please move along. But uh, most of them are uh, staying with them for now. Uh, the other thing I'm tracking is, you know, uh, DNSSEC adoption by various TLDs. Again, maybe to encourage those TLDs to promote Dane. Not surprisingly, we see that .com is by far the biggest deployment at 5.2 million. Uh, NL and CH have incentivized the use of Dane. Uh, and so we can see that uh, they're, they're pretty high on the list. Uh, and you can uh, check the, the data on the survey page and look up your favorite TLD. Uh, this, is, this shows you growth over time for .com. You can find the data for each of the TLDs that have at least 1,000 signed domains. Uh, here you see the introduction of incentives for the Swiss domain. All of a sudden, the slope changed radically. And then you see adoption by a few providers who decided to cash in uh, and take advantage of the discounted rates on the registrations. Uh, here's .dev. Uh, and you know it's by far the smoothest ride of all the uh, TLD signing. No blips, just steady growth over time. Uh, here is... Uh, the, the survey supports drilling down to look at your particular domain or your particular TLD. Uh, and here we see IETF.org, and we see that IETF.org has some deprecated algorithms to take care of. 
Uh, and we see their TLSA records, but we can also look at their DNS key records and how old they are and their DS records and whether the certificates match the TLSA records and all that kind of fun. Uh, and finally here, we see some providers who host a lot of email customer domains and whether their domains are, uh, whether their MEX hosts are signed and if so, whether they have TLSA records. And we're seeing some significant progress on Dane TLSA adoption by providers who host lots of signed domains. So once we remove Google and OVH from the top two, you'll see that Dane is quite prominent. Uh, from there on down, there are a few gaps, uh, but certainly one.com and, uh, and uh, hostpoint.ch and so on uh, are fully Dane enabled and outlook.com will join them sometime. Uh, in an, uh, I think it's early 2023 or maybe it's even late this year, I don't remember. Uh, so anyway, that's uh, that's it. Uh, question time. If there are, if there's time for any questions, of course. Yeah, there's a few minutes for questions. All right. It looks like, actually, John has a question. Go for it. Oh, it's working. Um, so, what do you see as the next? It seems like web browsers have so, sort of reached a dead end. That they're not the next obvious thing to implement Dane. Is there an application that you would see as an obvious adopter for this that would try to accelerate the process since SMTP seems to be going rather smoothly? What's the next, what's the next application you'd say would be obvious for this? You mentioned uh, recursive to authoritative, but that's relatively small. Yeah, so that... Yeah, so recursive to authoritative is kind of the obvious one that comes to mind. Um, I don't know what uh, what are the other ob obvious ones. So uh, increasing uptake where we have some some penetration like XMPP and Jabber, but they, that might also be a small application community. I don't know. Victor, do you have any other suggestions? So uh, while a dot may be a, a niche application, it's still high volume and it matters. So if that happens, that'd be great. Uh, we may see uh, particular uh, applications, you know, there are apps on phones and so on that decide to do it. I know Apple has just released support for DNSSEC that applications can opt into. Maybe some of them will have creative uses. The hash DNS people, not that I particularly think blockchain DNS is going anywhere, but they're using it. So I think it'll be creative new uses. Uh, is uh, other than SMTP uh, is where uh, where it's going to go. Yeah, and uh, just to follow on, it just occurred to me the the other uh, area where uh, we could see some uptake is uh, new activity. So we're also I didn't have time to go over it, but it's in my slides. We're talking about using Dane to authenticate uh, TLS clients too, and there is definitely some interest in that. So there are some application. Uh, applications that are looking at that. So that's relatively new. It hasn't been deployed yet, but that's where I think Dane uh, will uh, receive some additional deployment. Okay. Um, there's a question in the chat. Give me a second. Would it make sense to get RFC 9102 implemented in OpenSSL and GNU TLS so we can at least experiment with it? IMHO, the hard part is the crypto libraries. Resolvers are easier to do, at least for us. So, yeah, sure. Uh, it would be nice to see at least one application show up and say we, we will do it so long as the extension is in. Uh, mostly, uh, the, 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 most of the complexity of the extension is in parsing uh, the the wire form DNS content. Most of the SSL libraries don't have that kind of thing in them. So I would expect to find the implementation, not so much in OpenSSL, which generically supports extensions, but in the DNS-centric library. So something like LDNS is probably perhaps a better home for it than OpenSSL. I'm Paul Hoffman. So I'd like to speak, because both of you had mentioned ADOT as a possible use, but that's only if that's going to be authenticated instead of, um, you know, the, the way that everyone in the working group wants, which is that it, at this point that there's going to be no authentication. So you don't need, in fact, 
this. That I would really hope that you wouldn't push that forwards because it will confuse the discussion of us trying to get it at all. At the point where there is a desire for authenticated um, uh, resolver to authoritative, it's an obvious solution, but there's there's so little interest in it and the people, the proponents of it couldn't even agree on how to do it. I would say it, it, it I, I would prefer that it was not brought up as a solution for ADOT until there is any interest in authentication. Yeah, I, I'm thinking longer term, but yeah, I understand the situation. Yeah. Uh, Paul, I don't think there's any threat to probing an unauthenticated ADOT if some sort of signaling is introduced. Uh, people will adopt it slowly and as they see fit. Uh, people will continue to either ignore the signal or not publish it. Uh, we will see largely unauthenticated ADOT for quite some time. Uh, the signaling activity can start now. It's not threatening the ongoing adoption. And I don't think there'll be any confusion either. Okay. Uh, I understand your we concern. Disagree. We disagree worried. on that, at least from the mailing list. People got very confused. So. Right. Okay. Uh, I'm not suggesting that there's anything morally wrong with people who do unauthenticated ADOT. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I feel vindicated. Well, let's do one final question and call it a wrap. Um, Last question, is there any chance that unilateral publication of Dane TLSA records for web servers would or could put pressure on browsers to support this? So I think people have been publishing Dane records for web servers for a long time, right? In I guess in the hope of uh, it happening someday, because I have one on my personal website since 2012, right? But And I'm not the only one, but it hasn't. Uh, hasn't really made it yet. Uh, I don't see that pressure as being particularly effective. Also, there used to be extensions for browsers or plugins that would do Dane authentication. They've mostly died out. Uh, so at this point, the incentives for publishing those are very low. Um, yeah, uh, I think we would need to succeed much more strongly for SMTP and really demonstrate that Dane is, is that more a lot more domains assigned, and that Dane is practical, and a lot more adoption of a dot and uh, sorry of DOH and DOT to get past the broken CPEs for Dane to become practical uh, on, on the browser. It's some time off. Yeah, and I think the the other way the middle box problem could be overcome is by uh, moving stub queries to secure transports like Doe, which could conceivably traverse middle boxes. So that might be an effort worth investing resource in, resources in. Okay. I think that's all we have time for. Much thanks to all of the speakers and to everybody who contributed to the discussion in the room and, and remotely. And I will now turn things over to Keith to wrap up. Okay, thank you, um, Shimon and Victor and Suzanne for this afternoon. Um, so, we're done. We put another uh, ORC, ORC workshop in the bag. Um, so it's really just that time to, to wrap things up and to, to thank all the various people. So um, where, are we, where are we with future workshops? Um, all our events last year were online. Um, we've managed two hybrid events this year. Uh, they've both very much been learning exercises. Um, we certainly had a few glitches over the past two days, so I thank you for your patience uh, while we uh, figured these out. Um, we're going to continue with whatever pandemic precautions are appropriate for in-person events for the foreseeable future, and we're going to continue with a hybrid format for the foreseeable future as well. Um, and obviously that's a work in progress, but we'd appreciate your feedback uh, via the survey or if you just want to get in touch with us about things like the format of the meetings, how long they are, how frequent they are, the safety precautions that we're putting in place. Um, as I mentioned at the start of the workshop, um, the plan is that the next one, Work 35, will again be hybrid. It will be co-located with the RIPE 85 meeting in Belgrade, Serbia. Um, we'll be doing joint programming with Centre Tech, um, and hopefully we'll be working with our partners in Serbia as well. 
Part 40, we'll be back in the States. Uh, we have a firm commitment to co-locate with Nano AK7. Okay, need microphone closer, sure. Um, Nano AK7 in Atlanta in uh, February next year. So, um, lots of thank you. Um, thank you to all ORC members and supporters that have continued to support ORC through these um, strange times. Special thank you to Comcast uh, for being not just the sponsor of this workshop, but also for all the local support and for extending the ITF connectivity for us. Um, and also to Verisign for being our patron for uh, workshops for 2022. Program committee. Program committee has worked really hard this time. Um, there's been a lot of stuff that they've had to deal with. Um, so um, really appreciate um, everything they've done for the programming. Um, really appreciate um, John doing the, uh, the panel, Pallavi has been busy driving the laptop, presenter laptop on top of all our other duties as PC chair. Uh, special thank you to Hazel, um, who has been um, our single remote program committee member. She's been busy doing a, a great job of um, social media over the past two days and also hosting the online um, social event last night. A um, bunch of people helped us out with um, logistics. Uh, I'd like to thank IETF um, and, and the MSL, including Stephanie there, uh, for all the help. Um, they really just bolted us on to the IETF meeting, and, and in many ways that's been very straightforward, so we appreciate that. Um, also, Con at Line Speed has been awesome, keeping things, um, keeping the network working throughout the weekend, um, and the Encore guys for all the, um, the AV help as well. Um, and, you know, I'd just like to thank the ORC staff as well. I mean, I've really enjoyed having everyone in the same place for the first time in, 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 in forever, um, including our two new team members. Um, I hope you've enjoyed that, and I hope you found it useful as well. Um, and, you know, special thanks to, uh, to Matt and Mike for driving all the, um, the webcast and audio stuff, uh, which has is, is certainly been um, a challenging learning exercise. Um, and um, you know, our future workshops are open to sponsorship or patronage. Um, so, if you're interested in, in extending, going beyond um, your membership, and you want to help out by supporting a workshop or sponsoring it, um, then please talk to Dinesh or, or, or Steve, and they'll be able to help you with that. That's it. So, a um, few wrap-up things. Um, thanks for all the talk rating. Um, that your data is very useful to the program committee and also to the speakers. Um, and um, for general feedback on the uh, workshop, there is a survey, um, so um, please use that to complete your feedback. Um, when you leave, um, we have a bunch of tests and masks. Um, feel free to take one or two away with you. We'd much rather you took them away and didn't expose family members on the way back, um, um, so that's helpful. Um, by the same token, we do not want to recycle your badges or lanyards. Please take these away and dispose of them. We don't want them to be a vector for COVID-19 or monkeypox or, 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 or whatever. Um, the CFP for Work 39 is open already. Um, so if you were inspired over the past two days to submit something yourself, then please go ahead and the, uh, the program committee will review that in due course. Um, and um, that's it from me. Um, I wish you all a safe journey home and look forward to seeing you next time. So thank you everyone. Thank you.